My three wives are beautiful vampires. Chapter 921, Small and Big Changes 2. Satisfied A more mature voice resonated around. Who are you? They all exclaimed at the same time. After all, the change was too drastic. She looked like a completely different person. Ugh, because of this, I hid my appearance, Kagaya sighed, and even though this gesture was quite monotone and lifeless, it was somehow very seductive. Again, who are you? They all exclaimed again. Their reaction was understandable, after all, Kagaya had never displayed this seduction in her behavior before. Amazing. Boss, you've become amazing. Maria jumped excitedly while looking Kagaya up and down. These parts have become Shugoi too. I wonder if she's rivaling Mizuki now, Roberta spoke while looking at a certain area on Kagaya's body. Kagaya covered her assets and looked closely at Roberta. Don't look at me like that. For some reason, it's exciting, Roberta felt her body warming up, which she found very strange since she didn't like women, she liked Victor, so why was she feeling this way? Pervert, Kagaya murmured. I am, and proud of it. Roberta tapped her chest. But that's not it, you have something strange, what is this sensation? Fu 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 fu, to think that our most diligent maid would enter this realm, Violet smiled. What are you talking about, Violet? Sasha asked. Idiot, look with your eyes, you'll understand, Violet said, not just to Sasha but to all the girls. Oh. The girls thought that they needed to get used to using their eyes to see the world more as it truly is. Looking at Kagaya with their draconic eyes, they all could understand. Traces of divinity, hey! Natasha murmured, something that was heard by everyone. Probably related in some way to a domain of lust. I think it's related to attraction, Carmilla suggested. I remember that if Aphrodite doesn't control herself, we would feel like Roberta just felt. Hmm. The girls made sounds as if they were thinking about something. Kagaya felt uncomfortable being watched like a rare animal, she wasn't a panda, okay? She didn't like that kind of attention. The door opened again, and this time a woman with long white hair and golden eyes emerged, surrounded by a woman with green hair and two women with black hair. Nix, Gaia, Mother, Persephone. Are you finished? Yes, Agnes spoke for the group. Victor is currently helping Hestia and Velnora, and they seem to have more difficulty dealing with their new dragon side. That's surprising, I never thought Velnora would have trouble with anything, Violet said. In her words. I'm simply not used to all these emotions on the surface, Agnes spoke as if she were the exact copy of Velnora. It seems our emotionless ally is discovering intense emotions, hey? Yes, Agnes nodded. Oya. Oh yeah. Kagaya shivered when she heard a sudden seductive voice next to her. Aphrodite. Don't startle me. Phew 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 phew, I'm sorry. I just felt something interesting and came to check it out, Aphrodite looked at Harina, who was sitting silently with her eyes closed, she looked at Mizuki, Helena. Vine, Vapor, Lily, who were in the same position as Harina. Then she looked at Kagaya. It seems we'll have new dragon gods at some point in the future, that's good. Oh. Ruby looked at the women Aphrodite had looked at and made some mental notes. Aline, help me with something. Yes. Aline, who was playing with a snowflake in her hand, looked at Ruby curiously. Victor's demon ladies had few changes in appearance, the only visible changes were their eyes, wings, and horns. They also gained a bit more height and more defined bodies. Other than that, nothing really changed visually, they still had their exotic appearances. What are you planning, Ruby? I want to make some plans for the new gods who will be born. Ruby and Aline began to talk as they floated out towards their laboratory. A system to use the information we received from Velnora more efficiently, so the new gods can use it as a reference and progress further in their divinity. Oh, that's quite clever, I support it. 
let's develop them. Shall we use the orb? It's time to revolutionize that technology. Let's make something more like Velnoraya's. An interactive holographic bracelet. Connected to a large server system. Let's create an AI too. Ruby smiled widely, her new brain working much faster than a supercomputer. I like the sound of that, fu 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 fu. Persephone rolled her eyes at Ruby and Alaness maniacal laughter. I hope sis doesn't become a Reed Richards, that would be catastrophic, Pepper said as she watched her sister's behavior. Don't worry, Victor will always keep an eye on her. Lacus dismissed Pepper's concern. M.M. Persephone and Nix looked at two specific women sitting in the corner of the room near a table, that area of the room seemed quite somber. Why are you in this depressive silence? We're contemplating life, Tasha murmured. Sometimes, difficult choices appear before us, and we don't know how to proceed, Lilith said. The problem for the two women was simple, seeing the drastic change in the group's power and how they had become stronger, they wanted to become dragons too, they wanted to get stronger. But they also didn't want to lose their status as progenitors. For Lilith. Her status as a progenitor is something that is a part of who she is, so she doesn't want to change that. For Tasha, the problem is more complex, she is the progenitor of a race that she has to care for, and she can't abandon her duties, so despite wanting to get stronger, she is also thinking about her people. Ha! Huh. What a dilemma! The two sighed at the same time. Persephone and Nix just shook their heads and decided not to poke this beehive. The door opened again, and this time Scathatch appeared alone. You called me, Violet. Yes, your teacher, Dun Scathe, is currently in Nightingale wanting to meet with Victor. At Scathica's brain stopped functioning with this news, of all the things she expected to hear from Violet, this definitely wasn't one of them. Violet looked at Aphrodite, accompanying her is currently the strongest goddess, Kali. The most badass goddess is here. An excited smile appeared on Aphrodite's face, I need to meet her. Aphrodite appeared near Scathatch and took the woman's hands. Let's go, Scathatch. W wait. She didn't have time to say anything because they both disappeared shortly after. Violet smiled lightly when she saw this development, then she looked at Gaia, your most beloved son is in berserker mode in your personal house. He entered this state upon feeling the change in his being. I will see him. Gaia sighed as she disappeared. Anyway. Just as Violet was about to say something else, Victor, Velnora, Hestia, and Zaladrak appeared in the room. Darling. Yo, I heard something interesting, I'm going to find them. Just as suddenly as he appeared, he also disappeared suddenly. Sometimes. He's very random, Sasha commented. M.M., Violet agreed, looking around and searching for Kagaya but not finding her. Sneaky woman, she thought internally as she realized Kagaya had followed Victor. The women subtly looked at Velnora and Hestia. The goddess of the hearth had her flaming red hair. Well, flaming? Naturally on fire? It was hard to explain what it was but it seemed that the flame she had protected so dearly had merged with her. And Velnora. Well, the woman had become amazing in various ways. Shugoi Dekai. Pepper unconsciously muttered as she saw the woman gain a few more inches in height, everything about her was big. Well, proportionate to her size, everything about her was proportional. Incredibly big? Hey. Translating Pepper's words. Velnora became completely confused about what she was talking about. You're not cultured enough to understand, Pepper said upon seeing the woman's confused face. Okay. Velnora simply accepted it, she had long since realized that the women around Victor were not completely normal, so she wouldn't try to understand something incomprehensible. Hestia. You. Violet pointed at her hair. Don't point that out, I know. I also didn't expect the flame to merge with me like this. Hestia sighed as her long red hair floated around. 
try to focus the flame inside your body, that should reduce energy loss, Amaterasu advised. Mm. Hestia did so, and in the next moment, her hair returned to normal, but just like Amaterasu's hair, people around could tell that her hair was very hot. The door opened again, and this time a woman with long black hair, blood. Red eyes, black horns with hints of violet with the same color tone going to her wings entered. She wore a long red and black dress, and her appearance was very similar to the man who had just left. Even though she hadn't changed much and had only become more defined, the woman had something that required everyone's attention. Immediately, all the women in the room were automatically drawn to the woman in a clearly supernatural way. Violet, Ruby, Sasha, Harina, Nix, Amaterasu, Agnes, Nadas Hyam, Nadi, and Carmila narrowed their eyes slightly when they felt a subtle manipulation coming from the woman. Hmm, where's Victor? He just left, Anna, Maria replied almost automatically, and she was just as surprised as anyone when she gave an immediate response, she clearly didn't want to say that. Anna raised an eyebrow when she saw Maria's response and her confused expression. I'm sorry, she said when she understood what she had unconsciously done. Anna retracted her presence, and soon that sensation disappeared completely from everyone's bodies. It's okay, Maria replied. Mm. Anna simply nodded. Incredible. This is so strong that it even affected us, Natasha murmured. Anna made an ironic smile, her power of honesty had reached levels she couldn't even quantify. But one thing was correct, in her presence, no one could lie if she so wished. The nature of her powers was so strong that not even she could lie to herself if she didn't make a great effort. But that wasn't all, upon transforming into a dragon, she gained a ridiculous affinity with runes. Let's train, we need to control our powers better. I think the forest is a good place. She spoke aloud as she suggested. Suddenly, the whole setting changed, and the girls were thrown into the forest. Hey! Various sounds of confusion were heard. What happened? Were we forcibly teleported? Nadie asked. Anna's lips trembled when she saw this. I thought I had controlled this. Ugh, I need Victor's help. Her affinity with runes had reached the point that even if she spoke something random, it could actually happen in reality as it had just now. This draconic rune affinity completely surpassed users who trained for it. Because compared to users who train for it, Anna is simply natural. If she speaks and wishes for something, it can happen in reality. It seems that her entire existence revolves around the power of speech, and to be honest, the reason she thinks so is that she didn't awaken any elemental affinity or even control creation on a smaller scale like true dragons. In terms of an RPG, it's as if her character had been completely reset, and all her points were allocated to charisma and speech, if she rolls the dice in charisma tests, the guarantee of success is more than 96%. Hmm, I'm sorry, it seems I'm not able to control myself very well yet, Anna said with an apologetic expression. Seeing Anna's powers, Violet's line from the future cannot help but echo in Violet's head, if Darling exercises the principle of domination. We exercise the principle of control. Domination cannot exist without control. Control cannot exist without domination. What is this power Anna? Runes. I have a huge affinity with that. She explained while trying to say as little as possible about things that can be summoned. Can runes distort reality? Pepper asked in disbelief. Pepper. You're not attending classes, are you? Laika scolded her sister. Ugh, I I. Yes. Pepper sighed as she admitted, in her defense, she didn't see the point in studying it, after all, she can't use it. She even tried in the past, but she always ended up falling asleep. But, that was something that needed to change, after all, all true dragons had affinities with draconic runes. Control and Domination Hey! I understand a little now. Violet smiled slightly, she approached Anna and held the woman by the shoulder. You heard the woman, let's train, 
we can't have a lack of control over our abilities, you don't want to embarrass our husband when we go out publicly, and we can't control our powers, right? Suddenly the whole playful, welcoming atmosphere became serious. The answer to Violet's question? They all had the same answer. Of course not. Then let's train. Yes. Chapter 922, An Encounter That Caused An Unconscious Breakthrough Callie, who was meditating in silence, suddenly opened her eyes when she felt a disturbance in Nightingale's space. Even though Victor had suppressed almost all of his power, such a significant presence that influenced so many things around could hardly go unnoticed by Callie, who had even more abnormal senses than her fellow gods. The obvious change in nature with the arrival of two true dragons was too significant to escape her notice. They have arrived. Yes, indeed, Dunscaith nodded. Unlike the powerful woman next to her, she didn't sense the arrival of the two true dragons but rather the approach rune she had given to her disciple. She still uses that gift, hey. That's sweet, Dunscaith thought with a gentle look, but at the same time confusion arose in her mind. If she's using that gift, how couldn't I sense her exact location before? Dunscatha's doubts didn't linger for long when she heard a voice. Darling, you came too. Aphrodite asked. Uh-huh. A confirming sound was heard. Aphrodite, let me go. Scathatch growled. Oh. Sorry, Scathatch. Tisk. How can you be physically stronger than me? Scathatch couldn't understand this. It's because I'm a goddess, Aphrodite boasted proudly. That doesn't explain anything. In fact, it does, Victor spoke. As I mentioned, dragons are compatible with all creation, especially divinity, so since her divinity is of a higher level, this status also applies to her physical body. After all, divinity nourishes the body and since there is no incompatibility between body and soul, both become stronger. Does that mean you're completely broken then? Scathatch commented expressionlessly. She didn't doubt Victor's words because he was the progenitor of her race and knew more about it than she did. But this specific doubt couldn't help but surface in her mind. If the level of physical strength was equivalent to his divinity, wasn't Victor completely overpowered then? After all, he had several things inside him that boosted his physical body. I mean. Yes. What's your level of strength now? Scathatch asked. I honestly don't know, but if I want to, I can lift several dense stars with just my physical strength, Victor replied absent-mindedly. He had never tried it, but thinking about it, he couldn't say it was impossible for him to do. That's ridiculous, Scathatch muttered. Indeed. I understand using your power to do that, but lifting it with physical strength alone. Aphrodite also couldn't believe it. Hmm, why don't we test it now? What are you going to do? Just an experiment. Victor created a massive earth sphere in his hand and then used his control over creation to add more weight to the object. One thousand, two thousand, ten thousand, one million. 100 billion, 500,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
Victor recalled that he once held the sun in the palm of his hand, though he was using his powers at the time. Don't forget the fact that you are not using your divine authorities to enhance your body or even in your dragon form. Hmm, that's also true, although, in my dragonoid form, I have the same physical strength as in my human form. But in my dragon form, the energy pulses more uncontrollably, so I must have more physical strength in that form. Victor deduced based on his previous experience of assuming his dragon form. He not only felt at ease with his energy in that form, but that energy was constantly surging within him like an inexhaustible battery. If he used all that energy efficiently, he had truly become a force of nature, hey? Only a few beings can handle me in this sector now, and I haven't even fully trained my divinities yet, Victor couldn't help but wonder how strong the beings in the next sector would be. Please stop playing with that ball. If it falls on the ground. Aphrodite was sweating nervously as she watched Victor playing with that supermassive ball. Nothing will happen. It's just supermassive Earth. Probably, there will be a hole, and the ball will pierce the planet in half, but... Victor let the sphere fall to the ground, and it plummeted at an astonishing speed, but the moment it hit the ground, nothing happened. My runes will cancel the gravitational effect. Aphrodite looked at Victor with an accusatory look. One day, this man would give her a heart attack. The level of irrational things he was doing was becoming ridiculous. She looked at the sphere again and thought of something. Then Aphrodite crouched down and tried to pick up the sphere. She narrowed her eyes when she couldn't pick it up with one hand and became even more frustrated when she couldn't pick it up with both. She covered her body with divinity and managed to lift it. But it was incredibly heavy even for her. This is ridiculous, Aphrodite said as she dropped the sphere on the ground. Ugh, now I'm sweaty, and my arms hurt. Aphrodite then muttered some draconic words, and her body returned to its normal state. Scathatch stared at the sphere for a long time. Can we make a gym with this? I mean, it's possible. Victor spoke as he waved his hand to dispel his creation. Is this really necessary? Won't our physical strength increase as our divinity becomes stronger? Aphrodite remarked. We can't ignore our bodies. After all, we are alive, and even we have muscles, so it should be possible to train those muscles, Victor said. Aphrodite rolled her eyes. You guys just want to sweat and feel the pain of training your muscles you masochists. Even if the gym is built, I won't participate, she scoffed, not wanting to exert such effort when she would naturally grow stronger. It's all right, you don't have to, Scathatch smiled as she leaned on Victor. Let me take care of that with darling. Aphrodite narrowed her eyes at Scathaka's affectionate gesture, and then her mind went into the gutter as she thought about Scathatch and Victor engaging in sinful acts with their sweaty bodies. Her body began to heat up as this image shifted, and instead of Scat Hatch, it was she herself in that compromising position. Actually, I think I should train too. I don't want to get out of shape, she said as she leaned on Victor as well. Scat Hatch rolled her eyes. As dragons, their bodies would always remain healthy no matter what they ate, so Aphrodite's excuse was invalid. On Callie and Dunscatha's side, the two women squinted slightly when they heard the group's conversation shift into an incomprehensible language. Even for them, who practically knew every language. Draconic language, hey, Dunscathe deduced. There was only one language she couldn't understand, and those were the supernatural languages exclusive to races, with dragons being one of the most challenging she had encountered. After all, when a dragon spoke, it was, in a way, imposing its will on reality. Just hearing the incomprehensible babble of the three conversing among themselves, several ideas began to form in Dunscatha's mind. The door opened, and when the two women saw the group, they opened their mouths in shock. Dunscathe was shocked by how beautiful Victor, Aphrodite and Scathatch were and shocked by how much her disciple had changed. Both externally and internally. Callie was surprised by something entirely different, it had nothing to do with the group's beauty because she didn't care about that. 
It was how her energy was perfectly synchronizing with Victor's energy. Oh! Victor raised an eyebrow when he felt his negativity and destruction divinity merging with the energy emanating from Kali's body. Unconsciously, Kali's energy began to leak from her body, and her clothes started to tremble, indicating that they were on the verge of breaking at any moment. If that happened, everything around her would be completely destroyed, leaving nothing. Victor floated in Kali's direction and did not stop his divinities from acting as they pleased. As he got closer to her, the energy became more controlled, and after so many years, Kali finally managed to relax her mind and body so that her body's energy wouldn't destroy everything around her. Hmm. This is unexpected, Victor said as he looked up with his draconic eyes. Everyone could clearly see the two energies merging and flowing into each other's bodies. Victor was literally acting as a filter for Kali's divinity so it wouldn't overwhelm her body. I made a breakthrough. She murmured incredulously when her previously stagnant divinity began progressing again. It was slow as a snail, but she had been stuck in this state for so long that she noticed immediately. Of course you did. Didn't you hear the saying that too much power unused is a bad thing? As always, Victor had strong social skills and could talk to anyone as if they were old friends. Energy should be allowed to flow like water, especially for beings like us who are connected to many things, one reason Victor wasn't like Kali was that he had Roxanne inside him, managing his energies and Nightingale and his own personal world to nourish with his energy. Let the water flow, let the water fill every corner of your being, don't hold the water back as before. Let it flow. Unconsciously, Kali closed her eyes, and her entire body began to glow with pure destruction energy. Her appearance started to change as her crimson hair turned into pure energy, her eyes took on the appearance of a galaxy of pure crimson, and her skin began to turn into pure energy. Eventually, it was no longer just a god in front of everyone. It was something more, something close to a primordial, but soon the effect was undone and Kali's appearance returned to normal. Kali opened her eyes, and they didn't return to their previous state, remaining a crimson galaxy. I see. That's what was missing. As expected, coming here was not a mistake. The mistake of foolish gods is that they overthink something simple. Power must be controlled? Yes, but it must not be prevented from flowing. Every corner of your existence must embrace your power. Slowly, Victor's appearance began to change as well, and just like Kelly, his entire body was covered in black, violet, and crimson. Soon, what was in front of everyone was something unknown. It wasn't a god, a dragon, or even a primordial, it was something more. Something terrifying, something that should not be allowed to exist. Ugh, Dunscathe closed her eyes and placed her hand on her head in pain. It was as if the very existence in front of her couldn't be comprehended with her senses. Ironically, something similar happened to Aphrodite and Scat Hatch. Be water, my friend. Victor smiled with a grin full of sharp teeth that divided his entire face as violet crimson eyes opened all over his body and looked in Kali's direction. Kali opened her eyes widely when she saw this being in front of her. Before she could even realize it, the clothes that controlled her power were completely destroyed and replaced by a long red dress that was her divine robes created with her own power. Even in this state, her power did not leak and continued flowing towards Victor. Because of this connection, she could see Victor's essence, and she could see why he was called the god of chaos. That pure, chaotic energy within him was pure madness, and even she knew that if she kept looking at it for too long, she would go crazy. Therefore, she closed her eyes, and three seconds after that, she opened them, and Victor's appearance returned to normal. I never thought Bruce Lee's words would be used in such a terrifying way, Aphrodite spoke while controlling her body's breathing and trying not to feel afraid of her own husband. Just what was that, darling? Scat Hatch, like Aphrodite, just kept looking at Victor. Waiting for his answer. She didn't blame Aphrodite for her reaction, after all, she felt the same thing as her now. What are you talking about, honey? That was me. Victor smiled slightly. 
I see. It seems like I should get used to it. Don't worry, today was special. I won't use it much, I don't want to scare everyone after all. Victor spoke with the same smile on his face. Aphrodite just nodded. She felt a little bad that Victor wasn't showing another part of himself to everyone, but in this case, it made sense. This wasn't something that should be shown to the family but to the enemies. Victor looked back at Kali, raised his hand towards the goddess, and said, Nice to meet you, Kali. My name is Victor. Kali looked at Victor's hand for a second. Normally, she would deny the handshake, after all, with just that handshake, she could destroy a being unconsciously, but when she remembered what happened and who this man in front of her was, she didn't care. Nice to meet you, Victor. The moment her hand touched him, her divinity of destruction took effect in full force, but nothing happened. No burst of power, no side effects, it just flowed naturally between the two. How long has it been since I touched someone? Callie wondered. It had been so long that even she didn't remember. The pleasure is all mine. Victor smiled gently, and then he let go of her hand, turned around, and floated toward his wife's back. The moment he moved away from Callie, the connection was severed, and the goddess's power exploded around her, destroying everything around her. Immediately, Callie controlled herself and tried to seal her power, but remembering Victor's words, instead of sealing her power, she let it flow into every corner of her existence. Then her body was covered in a red energy of pure destruction, but the power didn't leak, instead of relying on clothes like before, she was doing it with her pure skill. A skill she already had but just wasn't using correctly. Callie looked at Victor, and when she saw the amused smile on his face, for a moment, she felt like she wanted to punch his face, but she didn't know why she felt that way, his smile was just annoying like that. Why did he move away? She felt dissatisfied with him moving away from her. The feeling of having her mind calm and body relaxed was something she had forgotten, and the moment she got it back, it was quickly taken away from her, not to mention that the feeling of being connected to someone and touching someone's hand without them being destroyed was something that wasn't exactly bad. You've definitely found an interesting partner, Siren. Skathika's attention left Callie and Victor and went to the woman with long brown hair, as she growled, Don't call me by that name. Chapter 923, Siren You've definitely found an interesting partner, Siren. Skathika's attention left Callie and Victor and went to the woman with long brown hair, as she growled, Don't call me by that name. Siren. Victor turned his head, confused, until realization dawned on his face, and he looked at Skathatch with a curious gaze. Oh. Dun Skatha's smile grew. Hmm, it seems you haven't told him about your old name, Siren. As I said, don't call me by that name. I changed it when I completed my training with you. Sensing an opportunity to tease her beloved disciple, Dunscathe decided to delve deeper. Fufufu, fu fu, denying your origins isn't a good thing. S.I. Skathika's eyes glinted dangerously, she knew her teacher's personality all too well, just as her teacher knew hers. Even though they hadn't seen each other for many years, they doubted that either of them had changed. After all, the essence of stubborn beings such as Skathatch and Dunscathe tended to endure the passage of time. Therefore, Skathatch didn't mind threatening her teacher. She had to demonstrate her power now, or this woman might become uncontrollable and say things she shouldn't. Both master and disciple knew that a threat from Skathatch was not a joke and that she would genuinely attack if pushed too far. So, Dunscathe's next reaction was not surprising to Skathatch. Skathatch. Dunscathe promptly changed the way she addressed her, as provoking a true dragon was not part of her plan. Seeing that her threat had worked on her teacher, Skathatch lowered the intensity of her gaze. She then looked at the woman for a moment. With her newly gained dragon eyes, she could clearly discern what kind of monster her teacher was. So many runes within herself. This level of complexity even surpassed her with her draconic runes. 
as expected of the rune monster. Merlin, Dunscathe, and Victor were simply incomparable beings in their respective fields, with the latter being even more abnormal than the others. I wonder what kind of development she will have when accessing the draconic runes. Skathika's eyes gleamed once again, this time with different feelings. She was curious and excited at the same time. Skathatch began to plan for this possibility to become a reality because, this way, she would have one more opponent to spar with. Victor had simply become too strong for her, and even though she had become a dragon, it didn't change the fact that he was still much stronger. Skathatch had no shame in admitting that if they fought seriously, she would lose and lose badly. For this very reason, she didn't declare her intention to have a duel between them to determine the nature of their relationship, after all, that was their favorite little game. Skathatch was undoubtedly his wife and lover, and she thought of herself that way. It wasn't a duel that would change her mind, but it was this very duel that kept things spicy between them. She wanted to duel with Victor when she was at the peak of her new race. Only then would she find true satisfaction. It might seem strange and incomprehensible to others, but for Skathatch and Victor, it worked very well. Tell me, Master. Why did you come out of your seclusion now? What a foolish question, my disciple. It's as if you don't know me. Dunscathe scoffed, then looked at Victor. Why else would I come? I came to study. That new rune you displayed in the transmission is something I've never seen in my life. Victor raised an eyebrow with amusement upon seeing the gleam in Dunscathe's eyes. It was the same obsessive look he saw in Hephaestus, the eyes of a maniac for their craft. Plans began to form in Victor's mind, and he smiled inwardly. He immediately understood how to draw this specialist closer to him. It was a completely different approach from Kelly. You had to demonstrate greater knowledge than her in her own field, which was somewhat questionable, given that, according to Scat Hatch, this woman was a monster like him. You came out for something as simple as that. Victor asked with genuine interest. Something simple. Dunscathe felt slightly offended by those words. If that was something simple, then what was complex to him? Interesting. So, what do you consider complex, Chaos Dragon God? Just call me Victor. After all, you're my master's teacher. Victor spoke neutrally, then raised his hand, and an object appeared in his hand, emerging directly from his shadow. Thank you, Kagaya. M.M. Kagaya smiled with satisfaction in his shadow, she missed this feeling. What appeared in Victor's hand was a failed prototype of a weapon when attempting to use draconic runes in a technological device to enhance performance. The goal of this technology? A weapon, precisely a hidden weapon for his personal assassins, a weapon that could act both at close range and very long range. With just a word, the weapon would switch from a sniper to a melee or short. Range weapon. This was a small project he had undertaken while bored. I consider many things complex, but for you to understand, you need to see this. He showed the weapon to her. Dunscathe raised her eyebrow as she took the object and examined it, then, she widened her eyes in shock. She couldn't read the draconic runes, but she could understand the purpose of the object to some extent. You're crazy. Opposing runes don't work like this. M.M. That's true, but at the same time, they do. Victor reached into space, and his hand disappeared into a kind of black hole. This was an ability that was a combination of the black hole he had thrown at the Elder God, the use of the black hole, and his basic understanding of space that he had gained from observing the runes on the bag he had received from Alexios, along with his wife's powers. Victor had created something like an inventory for himself with a storage capacity that varied according to his energy. And since he had a lot of energy, the space was essentially infinite. Victor pulled out a deagle, a successful prototype of the weapon he had given to his beloved daughter. Take it, this is another prototype. Victor showed the deagle to Dunscathe. When she analyzed the deagle, her eyes showed a lot of confusion because, she couldn't understand anything. 
she could see that the weapon was entirely made of runes, but there were so many of them. And all were united in a language she had never seen before. There were even opposing runes in these weapons. Again, she couldn't read the runes, but with her experience, she could somewhat grasp the purpose of these runes. What is this? She murmured in shock. Something simple. Victor smiled. Simple. Dunskatha's eyebrow twitched at that word. Victor chuckled internally, truthfully, he was being dishonest with this woman. After all, this weapon was not made solely with runes, and he didn't create it alone. This was his work with Hephaestus, but she didn't need to know that. Victor pulled out another deagle, this time the same version of the weapon he had given to his daughter. Try to understand this. This is something I consider complex for now. What do you mean for now? Dunscathe asked as she examined the object and this time. She didn't understand anything. Nothing. There were more runes on this small object than on the previous one. Our faction will revolutionize runes again, of course, and this weapon will become something simple. Especially now that I have a dragon goddess of technology in my group. Silence fell around them as Dunscathe just stared at the weapon, and her whole body trembled. Her face was completely covered by her long brown hair. Shit, Scathatch muttered when she saw the state of her teacher. She knew this reaction all too well. Darling is definitely cunning. He understood my teacher's personality with just one look. But he made a mistake. Dunscathe looked at Victor, her brown eyes gleaming with obsessive desire her face flushed. She's a complete pervert for her craft. Much more than Hephaestus. She let the weapon fall to the floor and lunged toward Victor, grabbing his hand. Please. Let me join your faction. Eh. That's a bit difficult, Victor made a slightly confused expression. After all, we're not recruiting right now, you know. We have to organize my faction, not to mention that we need to focus our efforts on advancing our technology even further. Advancing current technology to a level of a thousand years into the future is not simple, you know. Victor spoke with a strained expression as if he were having trouble making the decision while, at the same time, he dangled more bait for Dunscathe. He even showed her a hologram of his future projects. Look, you see? This isn't something easy to accomplish. Dunscathe's body trembled even more when she saw the project, which was a type of technological spaceship. She saw notes about covering the entire spaceship with runes. The more she read about the project, the more her body shook. This was revolutionary. Her mouth watered at the thought of this becoming a reality, and just imagining it was driving her crazy. I take back what I said. He completely expected her to be a pervert for her craft. Scathatch shook her head from side to side as she watched how he had lured the big fish called Dunscathe in with just a few words. He's truly a playboy, Scathatch internally scoffed. Dunscathe looked at him, horrified. Impossible. You have to let me in. Come on. I'll do anything for you. Hmm. I may or may not make a deal. Spit it out. Tell me what you want. Except my body, I'll give you anything. Oh? Why not your body? Victor asked curiously. I am an honorable woman and a warrior. I will only give my body to my husband and the man I acknowledge. I'm not so desperate for knowledge that I would sell myself. She scoffed. Yes, Victor's knowledge had reignited her passion, but she wouldn't lose herself because of it. She still held her principles principles she had nurtured throughout her life and passed on to her disciples. Respect yourself, no matter what. She was a rune scholar, but before that, she was an ancient woman, a warrior, and a teacher. Mm, I can respect that, Victor nodded, able to fully respect that mindset. But don't worry, I'm not interested in your body. Dunscathe raised her eyebrow, slightly irritated to hear those words from someone like Victor. Right. What do you want? Women, Victor internally chuckled when he felt Dunscathe's dissatisfaction. 
In exchange for working with me, I want a loyalty contract. A loyalty contract? Of course, do you think I would let someone study my technology so easily? Victor scoffed. The contract is simple, as long as you don't betray me, nothing will happen to you, and you won't lose the knowledge you've gained. Hmm. I can accept that. Of course, I'll read the contract before agreeing. Dunscathe said. Now that she was calmer, she could see the logic in Victor's words. Good. Victor smiled, and then he added, of course, you should also be willing to tell me embarrassing details about Scathatch. Wait, what? Scathatch interjected. Dunscathe smiled. That's something I can easily do. No, you can't. You. Don't worry, honey. I won't ask anything about your past that you don't want me to know, Siren. Victor spoke gently. Scathatch shivered when she heard that name come out of Victor's mouth, and Scathica's flushed expression when she heard him speaking that name was quite satisfying to Victor. I'll wait for you to tell me in person. Thank you, darling. Scathatch felt quite sweet now. Dunscathe felt uncomfortable with this pink atmosphere. It was too sugary for her single heart. Of course, embarrassing details are not included in that category. Victor smiled cunningly. You dot. Scathatch was about to say something, but Dunscathe interrupted with laughter. Phew phew phew, I remember a day when Scathatch went bear hunting for me with only the strength of a human due to the limitations of my runes, and she got quite beaten up that day. On that day, she dot. Wait, don't say that. Scathatch covered her teacher's mouth to prevent her from blabbering. A glint of amusement appeared in Victor's eyes, and when Scathatch saw that, she groaned inwardly, knowing that the next few days would be quite stressful for her. Chapter 924, The Strongest Woman? That's debatable. While Victor and Dunscathe's duo taunted Scathatch, Aphrodite stealthily approached Callie. Callie. She smiled gently upon seeing her friend, but she didn't hug her as she normally would in this situation. Despite trusting her current body, she didn't want to risk vanishing due to her recklessness. Aphrodite A small smile appeared on the goddess's face when she saw Aphrodite, but this smile quickly turned into a look of shock when she saw Aphrodite's divinity. Impossible. How is she already at this threshold? Callie thought noting that she herself took thousands of years to reach this state. Even though Aphrodite was nearly as ancient as she was, Callie knew very well that Aphrodite hadn't put in as much effort into enhancing her divinity as she had. Seeing Callie's expression, Aphrodite proudly huffed, causing her assets to sway from side to side and up and down. She could already imagine what had led this goddess to display such an expression. Incredible, isn't it? Yes. But just how is this possible? He he he, of course, it's because of darling and my love for him, Aphrodite spoke but didn't elaborate much. Callie fell silent upon hearing this. She wondered if her mind was playing tricks on her or if she had indeed heard that Aphrodite had reached this level of divinity because of Victor. Callie, Callie. What made you come out of your seclusion? Not even my visit in the past could get you out of it. Victor. His rapid evolution intrigues me, she spoke honestly. There was no reason to lie to her friend. As expected. It seems my amazing husband caught your attention, Aphrodite smiled broadly as she nodded. Callie narrowed her eyes slightly. She felt that Aphrodite was speaking with ulterior motives behind those words, but she decided to ignore that feeling. After all, she was talking to Aphrodite and the woman always had other intentions behind her smile. The reason she chose to ignore this feeling was that those intentions wouldn't be harmful. Despite Aphrodite's eccentricity, she cared for her people. In that case, why don't you visit my home as my guest? Or do you plan to return to your pantheon now that you've found Darling? I... Callie fell silent. Initially, she had only planned to talk to Victor about his strength and since she hadn't had the chance to do so, she would stay here until they spoke. 
but, the previous incident had been quite revealing to her. Just meeting him, without even saying anything profound, had helped her become stronger, so she could say that she had already achieved her goal on this trip. All she needed to do now was return to her temple and meditate again. But, she felt it would be a waste to do that. If just one meeting without deep conversation had helped her so much, what would happen if they interacted more? And learned more about him? Wouldn't she become even stronger? Callie was quite intrigued by this possibility, so instead of returning now, she made a decision to stay. I will go with you. M.M. Aphrodite nodded contentedly. Good, very good. Kaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
Inside the mansion, in Victor's room, Jean, who had been meditating, opened her eyes. Tisk, I let my guard down, and to think I would let someone other than my husband or my brother see my soul. Her eyes narrowed. Wait, but this is Darling's fault, isn't it? He brought that woman here. This world was supposed to be our safe haven. But that doesn't justify my mistake. Ugh, this annoying pride. She was struggling with this pride and lust that she felt in excess due to her dragon body. Despite having a saintly appearance, she was anything but saintly, she was worse than a lustful demon in heat. The adaptation phase is more irritating than I thought, Jean thought. At first, she didn't feel these effects, but everything started to change recently when her soul began to bond deeply with her current body. As her original strength returned, the dragon's desires returned. Essentially, as the guardian of the universal tree, she was connected to her brother. As the first guardian born before the universal tree, she received the blessing of that being. She could use all of her brother's abilities, along with her own personal abilities, but this applied only to abilities and not her brother's authority. For example, she couldn't create world trees, work to maintain the universe or participate in the reincarnation cycle. Those were her brother's authority. She opened her hands, and three spheres appeared, one a natural green, one white and one black. The green sphere was slightly larger than the white and black ones. The white and black spheres had a peculiarity. The white sphere was so white that it didn't illuminate anything around it, and the black sphere was so black that no light was reflected. It was evident that both spheres were extremely pure. I can finally use my abilities again, Jean murmured while playing with the spheres. Although it's really weak. As she played with the spheres, she mused aloud, but is this really okay? I wonder what he was thinking by letting me keep these abilities. Initially, she thought that when her duty was done, he would reclaim the gift he had given her, but that didn't happen. Unfortunately, he's no longer present for me to ask, she said with a wave of her hand, causing the spheres to disappear. She began to float toward the door. Primordial chaos. If you were sentient, I would have questioned you about why you allowed me to continue with these powers, she sighed as she thought. Although I'm sure you wouldn't say anything and would act mysteriously as always. Chapter 925, The Strongest Woman? This is debatable. 2. Entering the mansion, Victor spoke loudly. Girls, we have visitors. Suddenly, all those draconic auras started coming towards Callie and Dunscathe. That's not scary at all. Dunscathe was in a cold sweat. Phew 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 phew, what is it, master? Can't you handle these little auras? Scathatch asked with a smile on her face, obviously enjoying her teacher's expression. Dunscathe gasped at what she heard from Scathatch. Just as she was going to say something, the auras were suddenly all gathering in the same spot. The first to arrive, of course, was the Fulgers. Aira, is this a master's master? Natasha asked. Master's master? What is that title? Sasha asked. Well, she trained Scat Hatch, who trained several other beings, so calling her that makes sense, Natasha explained. Hmm. That makes sense. Sasha thought. You think? That sounds like the title of some kinky porn. Nady said. Now that you say it. That's true. Carmilla just remained silent as she looked at Kelly. Mm, she's strong. She nodded in satisfaction. Then, more auras began to approach, and this time, they were the Scarlet Sisters. Boom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Pepper. You destroyed the wall. Sienna shouted. I'm sorry. I can't control myself yet. Pepper grumbled as she got up from the ground and created holes with that simple gesture. Kyaaaa, I'm not that heavy. Why is everything so fragile? Pepper, stop struggling, you're destroying the place. Sienna spoke. I'm sorry. A cloud of smoke appeared from the hole 
and a tall woman appeared with the same features as the others. Lakas. Help me here. Pepper begged. Lakas just sighed, and with a wave of her hand, smoke covered Pepper's body, and she began to float. Thank you, Lakas. Use your wings, Pepper. Oh. Okay. Pepper's wings flapped, and soon, she began to float around. Lakas cancelled her smoke around Pepper. You should pay attention. Out of the four sisters, you were the one who gained the most physical strength. I know, but it's very difficult. Pepper felt like a baby who was learning to walk again. Seeing Victor look at her with a gentle smile, she blushed a little and complained, Why is everything so fragile? It feels like I'm living in a paper world. I can't even touch my manga now. Well, think on the bright side. At least you now know how Superman feels. Violet said as she appeared floating into the room with Agnes Mizuki, Harina, and Maria beside her. Hmm, you're right. Pepper thought as she floated around like she was in zero gravity. Violet looked at Kelly, and a smile appeared on her face. That smile seemed to contain many meanings that Kelly couldn't understand, but she felt very uncomfortable looking into those violet eyes. Then Ruby, Aline, and a tall woman arrived. Unlike Jean, she was containing her aura, she wasn't as relaxed as the other girls yet. For this reason, when Kelly saw Velnora, she opened her eyes again in shock. Again. Just what is wrong with this group? Just in one visit, I've already seen two women who might be stronger than me. She thought. Strongest woman? That title was quite questionable in front of Jean and Velnora. Kya, what is this? Pepper suddenly screamed as she was grabbed by someone. Umu, never change, Pepper. It's always fun to see you. Victor said as he held Pepper and stroked her head. Pepper blushed a little, and unconsciously, her height returned to what it was before. She enjoyed having her body completely embraced by Victor like this. She felt quite protected, even if she was a dragon with the power to destroy the world, that didn't change her feelings. She likes that feeling of protection. Therefore, she hugged him tightly as she smiled contentedly. He 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 dot. Vic. Vic she repeated several times while smelling his body. Victor just laughed as he stroked her hair and sometimes touched her horns and slightly pointed ears. Every time he touched these areas, Pepper's body would shudder slightly. Sienna, Lakas, and Ruby rolled their eyes at Pepper's attitude. She shouted that she was mature out there, but in front of Victor, she always went back to being the same. Victor, don't spoil her too much. She needs to grow up. Sienna scolded. It's okay. Pepper is perfect the way she is. He 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 he. Victor's attitude attracted the jealous eyes of several dragons, and the oppressive feeling became even stronger than before, making Dunscaith sweat like a pig waiting to be slaughtered. Girls. Violet raised her voice sternly, and like magic, the feeling passed and the women returned to looking at Callie and Dunscaith as if they were rare animals. This isn't uncomfortable at all. This isn't scary at all. Dunscaith thought. Scat Hatch just laughed at her teacher's expression. She was trying to pretend to be noble and cunning like before, but it was impossible to maintain that attitude in front of so many dragons. Victor. You're finally here. A melodious voice echoed around the room. And that voice alone made Callie and Dunscaith's spine shiver. When they looked in the direction of the voice, they saw a woman with long black hair, wearing a black dress that showed off her legs covered by black thigh-high stockings. Her face was very similar to Victor's. Mother. Victor smiled gently. Hearing what Victor said made Callie and Dunscaith look at Anna even more closely. Anna smiled gently and said cordially, You didn't even bring a gift. I wanted to try some local ice cream. The next moment, several ice creams began to sprout literally out of nowhere. Ice cream rain, yay dot. Pepper moved away from Victor and jumped into the air to catch the ice cream. Since she became a dragon, 
her hobby has been trying all kinds of different foods. A hobby that was shared by almost all former vampire nobles who only drank blood in the past. When Pepper picked up the chocolate ice cream and started licking it, a silence fell around the room as Anna's smile trembled, and she almost lost her gentle face, but she managed to bear it and remained quiet as if nothing had happened. Dunscatha's eyes practically popped out of her sockets at such a display. Runes. That was runes. Runes in the purest sense of the word. This woman is distorting reality with runes. She was internally freaking out. She looked at Anna with a rather obsessive look, which made the particular woman feel slightly uncomfortable. That's surprising. Mizuki muttered as she took the ice cream and analyzed it. She also had special abilities that evolved because she was an Onmyoji, but what Anna did was practically bend reality. When she tried the ice cream, she saw that it tasted the same as the ice cream she ate when she was human. That doesn't seem to be fake. What a scary woman! Mizuki thought. A thought that echoed throughout all the wives present. Indeed. Velnora nodded while analyzing the ice cream with her suit. Even though it had new features, her current body didn't change much, and her suit was quite malleable. Therefore, she was still dressed in her technological suit that exposed all the curves of her body. There is a small energy in this ice cream. Is this the reality controlling power of blood dragons? It seems like the runes are resonating with this power unconsciously, hey? Velnora thought. Power is the energy source, and the runes are the code. In this way, she was able to bend reality. Interesting. She never thought she would make this kind of discovery here. She was very happy to have chosen Victor and trusted him. Kali was in the same state as Dunscathe. Another powerful woman. Even though she didn't have as much power as Velnora and Jean, her power was quite troublesome. Callie couldn't help but look at Victor with a new look of respect. This man is too exceptional to gather so many powerful lovers like this. I need your help, Anna spoke, admitting her complicated situation. She couldn't say anything that could come true, it was very strange, and she hoped to control it. I noticed. Victor nodded. Kagaya. A woman stepped out of Victor's shadows. Ah. Boss woman. You are sneaky, you ran away with master. Roberta appeared while talking to Kagaya, and then Eve, Roberta, and Natalia appeared, too. Seeing Victor, Natalia wasted no time jumping towards him, and a tear in space appeared. The next moment, she was hugging him. Darling. Victor smiled gently and stroked Natalia's head. He wouldn't deny a hug from his beloved wife. How are you feeling? Powerful. And as if I am living in a fragile world, even space seems fragile now. She commented. That's what it means to be a dragon. I love that feeling. Umu. Victor nodded. Kagaya ignored Roberta and continued looking at Victor waiting for orders, she was eager to serve. Feeling this gaze, Victor said, show our guests around, but avoid the prohibited areas, and also prepare the contract I mentioned before. I will be back soon. Yes, Master. Victor looked at Violet, Violet, Agnes, you know what to do. M.M., leave it to us, darling, Violet spoke for herself and her mother. Then, Victor looked at Ruby and snapped his finger and an item appeared in her hand. That's it. A gift I gave to my daughter. Velnora and Aline looked curiously at the weapon, and the three intelligent women visibly shuddered at the weapon's capabilities. You are crazy? How can you give that to a child? Ruby couldn't help but say with this weapon, this was basically several nuclear weapons of destructive power. Don't worry, she is my daughter. She is very competent. Victor said with a smile. It was at this moment that all the wives here thought that when they had a daughter, they must educate the children because Victor would spoil them so much. Husbands shouldn't spoil their daughters too much. That's bad. Amaterasu appeared floating while speaking seriously. You think? Victor asked. Yes. 
mm. I'll control myself. For some reason, I can't trust you on that, Amaterasu spoke with a tight smile. It's okay, as long as they don't destroy a planet. No. That's not okay, all the wives thought. Victor. Anna called him. She wanted to solve this problem quickly. Oh, yes. Let's go. Victor spoke. Persephone, you're coming too, Victor spoke to the goddess of the underworld, who was sitting surreptitiously away from everyone. At. She pointed at herself in disbelief, but when she realized he was talking to her, she nodded and floated toward him. Where are the other goddesses? Currently in the ancient Egyptian pantheon. Violet, who was more in the know, spoke. Nyx, Hestia, and Gaia went with them. Our goddess of luck is nearby, right? Victor asked. Yes, she won't run away anytime soon. Good. Helena, Vipar, Vine, and Lily, how is hell? It's okay, darling. Don't worry, we won't forget our responsibility. Helena assured. Mm, let me know if you need anything. I will. Helena smiled. Victor looked at the female dragon who was imitating a ten-tailed fox, Herina, what about the yukai? They are already in the process of changing. With my current form, it has become much easier to do things. Do you regret it? No way, darling. You were correct. Herina shook her head in denial. The dragon race was simply too broken, especially Victor's race. Instead of needing to train her powers all over again, her powers merged and created something even more terrifying, not to mention that she no longer needed to use Yuki or Senjutsu. She could directly use the energy from her dragon heart, which was much purer and stronger. Not to mention that due to her connection with Senjutsu, she became a kind of nature dragon that could use the energy of the world tree. Her connection was not as deep as Victor, who had Roxanne and Amara, but she could still use this energy better than before. I told you. Victor smiled. Anyways, treat the guests well. I'll be back soon. Okay. MMM. Yes, darling. Several confirmation sounds were heard. Come on, Anna, Persephone. Yes, Persephone spoke. MMM. Anna nodded. Chapter 926, A Dangerous Power In a large, private room, Victor sat on the couch with Persephone next to him and Anna in front of him. First, let's test the limits of your powers and how they are activated. That way, we can get an idea of how to control them. Victor explained to Anna and then spoke in draconic language. Seal the space until I remove the seal. The moment he said this, the entire room was sealed, and no one could leave or enter without Victor's permission. Anna's eyes brightened slightly when she saw this demonstration of the use of runes with her draconic eyes. Although it looked the same as what she did, it was completely different. After all, it was apparent that Victor had more control over this particular skill set than her. Persephone, watch closely. As a dragon, this should be a learning experience for you. Yes. Victor, Persephone said as she closed her eyes for a few seconds. When she reopened them, her eyes began to glow slightly as she focused on using her new abilities to see more than usual. This glowing effect only occurred when someone had not mastered their ocular powers completely. If she were proficient in this basic technique, the glow in her eyes would not appear, and they would always be activated, as in Victor's case. Now, let's begin. Anna say the word, weapon. Weapon. She spoke while tilting her head confusedly. The next moment, several kitchen knives and dolls that looked like Victor began to appear out of nowhere. Hum ha. Huh. Anna didn't understand why Victor's kitchen knives and Victor dolls appeared. Her energy hasn't dropped much. Her dragon heart is stronger than most, hey. Victor thought as he looked at the kitchen knives on the floor and dolls of his likeness. Just with that demonstration, he was able to understand almost everything related to Anna's power, but he needed even more testing. Well, 
she is your mother, Victor. Your souls are very similar, so when she evolved, some of your predominant characteristics passed to her. Roxanne spoke. Not only is her dragon heart more efficient, but I can see that she has a small connection to the planet in the same way as Harina. Amara explained. Does that mean she can take the energy that you emit and transform it into natural energy to use? Victor asked as he narrowed his eyes more and looked deep into Anna's soul, only to discover that Amara was right. No, she can use some of our positive and negative energy directly. It must be because of this that her runes are so powerful. Amara explained. Add to that the basic ability of true dragons to control creation, with dragon runes being synonymous to the codes of creation, along with a substantial amount of talent. It's no wonder she is so strong that she can't control herself. Roxanne nodded. Anna, say the sentence, I want a weapon of mass destruction. Anna briefly hesitated to say this. After all, she was a little afraid of hurting Victor, but those fears disappeared when she remembered who the man in front of her was. It would take much more than a simple weapon of mass destruction to hurt Victor. I want a weapon of mass destruction. This time, a little more of Anna's energy was used. If we were to label it as a percentage out of 100% of her energy, only 15% was expended. An expenditure that soon began to recover thanks to Anna's dragon heart. The moment she spoke those words, various missiles, tanks, and military equipment began to appear around the room, and a very realistic doll of Victor as well, a doll that looked more like a golem. Persephone opened her eyes widely when she looked at this scene. With her draconic vision, she could clearly see various energies coming together to fulfill Anna's wish. In something so simple, such a complicated process is done. I need to learn more. Persephone stared even more intensely at this result. Meanwhile, Victor felt his lips tremble a little when he saw the golem of himself. Just what kind of image does my mother have of me in her head? He shook his head internally as he sighed a little. Darling. That's, Roxanne was going to say something, but Victor cut her off by saying. Yes, I know. Her powers are based on her understanding of the world. For her, weapons of mass destruction are missiles, tanks, and apparently myself. Because of this, these items were created in reality. This is dangerous. She needs to have an exact image in her head, or she might create something terrible in reality Amara said. I don't even want to imagine if this power was in the hands of a crazy person. Victor nodded, being able to imagine this scenario perfectly. It was because of this that powers that distorted reality needed to be very controlled, or something terrible could happen. Fortunately, Darling is stronger than this power, so nothing she says inappropriately can hurt our family. We need to place isolation runes like this all over the mansion, if possible, on the entire planet. That way, if she uses her powers inappropriately, the effects will not spread beyond the established space. Roxanne spoke. Victor and Amara completely agreed with her. For now, this power was okay because, essentially speaking, Victor had the same power as Anna, and his was much more powerful because he had Amara and Roxanne within him to nourish the effects of the reality warp. At her current level of proficiency, as long as the energy Victor used was greater, Anna would not be able to break the effects of his technique. An example of this was that even as Anna had used her skills, her powers did not leave this space isolated by Victor. Keep thinking of words you want to say, and keep saying them. Hmm. Okay. Anna nodded and then began speaking several random words from her head. Ball. Photos. Pictures. While this was happening, Victor was listening internally. But if you think about it the other way, Victor, until Anna learns to control this power, she cannot leave your side. After all, you are the only one who is strong enough to stop the consequences of her power. Amara spoke. Victor and Roxanne agreed with Amara. Anna's raw talent completely surpassed all the other girls in this regard. She was second only to Victor, 
and that was because Victor held within himself all the essential energies to make reality more vivid and because he was the progenitor of the race, with memories of several ancient beings within him that he consumed. Not to mention that he understood the system and was a god of the highest order. If Anna had complete access to positive and negative energy and had a rune related divinity, and if she understood the system the same way Victor did, her reality distortion could surpass even Victor's, and the reason for this was simple. In RPG terms, Victor was a character with potential in several different areas, while Anna was a character exclusively focused on one area. Consequently, her entire existence would focus on improving that exclusive area even further. But those were a lot of what-ifs. There was no point thinking about that now. He needed to work with what he had. But this potential exists within her. Let's nurture her to become someone formidable. Victor smiled internally. He wouldn't give up until she reached her full potential. Fortunately, he found a competent teacher to help Anna with her rune issues. Scat Hatch, Zoladrak, and Dunscathe should be enough to teach her anything she needs. Not only would these three women teach Anna, but they would also learn from each other and become even more formidable, a group that Victor would definitely join. Is that all right, darling? Dunscathe is not yet our full ally. Roxanne spoke, and by a full ally, she meant that she was not Victor's wife. It's okay. Even if she learns something new and tries to betray me with it, all her knowledge gained from the moment she stepped into my house will be erased from her head. And even if she stores the knowledge elsewhere, the contract will ensure that all of it is erased. The contract that Victor was offering was not a simple one. It was a contract made with his reality distortion working in tandem with his soul powers. This contract directly bound the individual soul to everything that was written. If Dunscathe breaks the contract, terrible effects would befall her. Victor did not think this was cruel. After all, it was essential to keep things a secret from the other pantheons. The technology and the runes she would learn were things that did not exist in another pantheon. You could say that it was something exclusive to Victor, and he would do everything to keep it that way. After 30 minutes of Anna speaking words that came into her head, she was running out of ideas of what to say. Luckily, Victor decided it was time to stop. Okay, that's enough, Victor said. Anna closed her mouth and sighed in relief. She felt pretty tired, like all her body's reserves were very low. She sucked down air like a marathon runner who was trying to catch their breath, and in the next moment, all the creations in the room disappeared, transforming back into energy and returning to her body. Her energy reserves which were previously very low, returned to almost half. Interesting. She can reverse the process unconsciously and take the energy used back. I didn't even know that was possible. Roxanne spoke. Victor nodded internally, also surprised. When he created something, he didn't usually undo it and recover the energy. He simply erased it. Hydrogen bomb, Victor spoke in draconic language and then a nuke appeared floating above his head. Victor focused his senses on the hydrogen bomb and tried to reverse the process. After a few seconds of trying, he finally understood what he should do, and slowly, the bomb began to come apart, and the energy returned to his body. I see. So this is what it means to be a monstrous genius at something, hey. Amara spoke. While Anna did this naturally as if it were breathing, Victor had to discover the mechanism behind it in order to reverse the process. This was the difference between a genius and an average person. Although Victor was anything but a normal person since he was also a monstrous genius like Anna. After all, now that he discovered the mechanism behind it, it became much easier for him to perform the process of reversing. But it was a fact that if it weren't for Anna, he wouldn't have discovered this. After all, it didn't make any difference for Victor. He had so much energy that he didn't mind wasting it. But the same was not possible for his wives. Therefore, this technique of reversing the creation process would be beneficial for them. Persephone, do you understand? Yes. I do. 
she'd watched Anna make the item so much that she herself was able to understand the mechanism behind it. However, understanding it and doing it with the same efficiency as Anna was something completely different. Good. Victor nodded, satisfied. What about you, Anna? After using your power so much, did you understand? I could not, Anna spoke with a face slightly flushed with embarrassment. Was she supposed to understand something? She was so focused on saying things and thinking about what to say that she forgot to pay attention. Mm, it's okay, there's no need to be embarrassed about it. After all, it's something that comes naturally to you. So it's harder to understand. Anna just nodded but didn't say anything. Let's start talking about the fundamentals of your technique. First, your powers work based on what you believe to be fact. For example, when I asked you to say weapon, what appeared? A kitchen knife, and you. She replied uncomfortably. Yes, this happened because, in your subconscious, you believed that a kitchen knife and I are a weapon. Victor, I. Anna wanted to try to explain herself, but Victor just shrugged his shoulders as if he had no choice. Your perception is not wrong. I am indeed a very dangerous weapon when I need to be. Don't think about it too much, I'm not upset. Victor spoke neutrally. Anna nodded as she bit her lip. She wanted to say something anyway, that although she thought he was a weapon, it was more like a defensive weapon that kept her safe. Victor, as someone who understood his mother very well, knew the thoughts she had about him. Because of this, he was not upset. In fact, being compared to a kitchen knife was quite significant for her. After all, when she wanted to defend herself against something, she would pull out her kitchen knife. That's what weapon meant to her. Your power is based completely on your own perception. It is based completely on the way you see reality, with your subconscious completely influencing your power. And that is a very dangerous thing. Dangerous. Yes, you have the power to distort reality with just one word, one word based on your perception. What does terror mean to you? Something terrifying, like a clown. Victor just shook his head, denying her thoughts. It's better to demonstrate it in practice. Say the word, terror. Terror. A miasma of some kind quickly left Anna's body and headed towards Victor. Anna's power tried to influence him in some way, but as he was more powerful than Anna herself, the power couldn't do anything. Instead, it went to Victor's left side and displayed a vivid image of Victor's dead body. That. Did you realize what just happened? Victor spoke with the same neutral tone, but it contained a clear seriousness. My power tried to do something to you. It tried. She couldn't utter those words. When you said the word terror, the most terrifying thing in your subconscious tried to come true. And what was that terrifying thing? My death. Anna shuddered at those words. As your power was unable to influence me to make your words a reality, it made something like an illusion, Victor spoke while looking at his body. Anna completely understood the word influence that Victor said. It was a simple way of saying that her power tried to kill him. Do you understand how dangerous your power is? Yes. She nodded while looking down. I, I'm sorry. Dot. She stopped talking when she felt her body float towards Victor. Victor placed her on his lap, stroked her long black hair, and lightly touched her horns, which were the same color as his. Feeling these caresses and Victor's warmth on her body, the bad feelings inside her began to slowly evaporate and without realizing it, the creation she made of Victor dying began to dissolve into energy and return to her body. No need to apologize. Something like that won't affect me, I'm the strongest, after all. I just want to demonstrate to you the consequences of using your power so that you can understand it and control it. Victor lifted Anna's chin and made her look at him. You understand? MMM. She nodded gently as she blushed slightly at her son's serious expression. Good. He nodded in satisfaction while smiling. 
she blushed again and placed her head on his chest as she took a deep breath. As she did so, she inhaled the intoxicating scent of her progenitor, and this made her even more comfortable. Consequently, she completely lowered her guard and relaxed. The aura from Anna's body practically exploded throughout the room now that she was no longer holding back and was relaxed. Persephone shivered slightly as she felt a sudden urge to speak several truths that she had been holding inside. This is dangerous. Even I can feel these effects, and I'm not even in the real world. Amara spoke. Her ability to make people be honest has become even stronger. No one can hide anything from her if she wishes to know. Probably only Victor and Velnora can resist this power in our faction. Roxanne spoke. From now on, I want you with me 24 sevenths. Until you can control this power, you must remain by my side. Do you understand? MMM. She nodded. She wasn't against this arrangement because she personally saw how dangerous her power could be, and she wasn't against staying by Victor's side like that. Anna needs energy control and intention control. As long as she learns these basics, she will be able to develop her powers without any problems. Roxanne spoke. Energy control is more essential. After all, if she knows how to completely stop the energy supply to use her ability, even if she intends to do something, the power won't work. Amara spoke. Don't compare Victor with others, sister. Few beings can completely stop themselves from using energy, Victor and Scathatch being one of them. That's a pretty insane level of control. Roxanne spoke. Is it that difficult? Amara asked in confusion. As a world tree of positivity that was born first, she had complete control of her own energy. Therefore, she didn't know the difficulties of someone controlling something that was natural. In biological terms, it was as if a human were consciously trying to stop the flow of blood from going around their body. This was an energy control far above normal. Victor and Scathatch had achieved this because they trained for it, but even Victor himself can't completely control his energy when he's in his dragon form. It just goes to show how difficult that control is. Yes, it's very difficult. Roxanne replied. Hmm. If you say so. Amara shrugged. As Victor stroked Anna's long black hair, he looked at Persephone. We need to talk. Persephone looked at Anna, as her eyes shone slightly with jealousy, and then she said. Yes, we do. Chapter 927 Amara and Roxanne Victor's Inner World Roxanne, did you see what Victor said about Anna? Yes, I saw it. What do you think? Well. Roxanne looked at that cosmic horror in the distance. Do you think anyone can top that? Amara was silent. As beings that were deeply linked to Victor's soul, she knew very well how scary that is, it is unlikely that anyone will overcome that in very summarized terms that is a pure entity of chaos taking shape, something that was completely outside the scope of creation. As I thought. Roxanne nodded, Amara's silence was all the answer she needed. Anna may be talented and have a lot of potential because she is Victor's mother, but that potential is very limited to just one scope of possibility. If the situation. What if Darling imagined happening, she will indeed become very powerful, but. I highly doubt anyone will surpass Victor in anything. From the moment he became a god, something changed in him. Something deep, something that makes Victor who he is. If it weren't for that, I would doubt that something like this would ever exist. Roxanne said, as a woman who is deeply connected to Victor, she was the most sensitive to his internal changes, much more than Amara herself who is just a newcomer. So even if the situation of Anna reaching full potential happens, I doubt it can affect Victor. After all, when she reaches that potential, Victor will be stronger, hey. Amara spoke. Correct. Roxanne nodded, and then said, follow me. Roxanne disappears, and appears from a deeper place in Victor's soul. Amara appears soon after, and asks, where are we? 
in the place where Darling's extra powers are. Extra powers. Amara gasped as she looked at the surroundings that were filled with different energies. Powers of beings he consumed but never used until this moment. This place appeared when he became a god. All this? Are you saying this is all a different power? Yes. Holy hell. Amara was in complete disbelief. She looked to one side, and felt the balls of energies floating, the power of time of Cronus, the empty power of the sun of Erebus, the darkness of Erebus, the power of adaptation, and the absorption of my former children. And much more. Not only that, you are just looking at the deities, here there are also the demonic powers he absorbed in the war, A and D. She floated towards a location with Amara following her, soon the two women saw the body of a gigantic demon. Diablo. Amara murmured. In Diablo's death in the past, Victor did not gain his most significant powers, but only his knowledge. In the past, I had found this strange, but I didn't think much about it, after all, this tended to happen. Roxanne narrowed her eyes. But I was wrong. It's not that Victor didn't gain his powers, his body wasn't prepared to absorb Diablo's power, because of that, he didn't gain any powers. But that changed when he became a god. Roxanne points to Diablo's disappearing legs. Diablo's Nephilim essence is being absorbed by Victor, consequently, Darling is becoming a being that breaks the balance. But why isn't the system alerting you to this? Amara asked. Because it's being done naturally, I guess. Roxanne replied, not even she knew why the system wasn't going crazy with Victor's existence, he was clearly a being that broke the balance by being a god of chaos. My theory is that as Victor's process happened naturally, and he was accepted by the two most authoritative primordials, thus gaining permission to have their deities, the system is not pointing out him as a being that needs to be eradicated. Unlike Diablo who tried to force his rise in a very artificial way. How ironic, the primordial demon that wanted to grow and become something bigger ended up just being food to boost someone else's growth. That's how nature is. Roxanne shrugged. Hmm. Amara looked in the direction of a location, and asked. Roxanne, what is that? Roxanne looked at the place where Amara is pointing, and narrowed her eyes. She floated in that direction, unlike the white space where hundreds of different powers were, what she saw was the perfect image of what the cosmos is, in that cosmos there were several small stars, but that wasn't what caught the two women's attention. And yes, two certain stars. In the middle of that cosmos there were two huge suns, a supermassive sun made completely of red energy, and a smaller sun made of white energy. When looking at the supermassive red sun, Roxanne was naturally drawn to that star. Just like Amara was drawn to the minor sun. That's the main deities begin, and negativity. Roxanne muttered. Isn't this unbalanced? Amara frowned. Yes, this one. This is a problem? After all, balance is essential for everything. Amara asked. I don't know. Originally, Victor is a being who was born on the negative side of the scale, he was a progenitor vampire, a being of the night, then he received Roxanne who is a world tree of negativity, only recently, he acquired some positive aspect within yes. You do not know. Amara looked at her sister in disbelief. Roxanne narrows her eyes at Amara. Just because I know a lot of things doesn't mean I know everything. In fact, Shouldn't you as the so-called big sister know this? Amara felt an arrow pierce her chest when she heard what Roxanne said. B. But, I never imagined being in this ridiculous situation. I don't even know how he unlinked me from my planet, and linked me to his soul, this situation is completely incomprehensible to me. Amara pouted sadly. Slap. Roxanne slaps Amara on the head. Ugh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop acting like a child, you're older than me. She snorted. Technically, we are the same age now, after all, you matured before me. Amara murmured. What did you say? Roxanne narrowed her eyes. Nothing. 
Amara quickly said. Roxanne snorted again, and said, Don't you have any thoughts to add? Well, our father always spoke about the importance of balance, because of this, the positive tree was sent first, so that the negative tree was sent next, in this way, slowly the two forces will balance and ensure that the planet grows healthy. Why is the positive tree sent first? Roxanne asked. The characteristics of positive energy if used first better influence the growth of the planet. Amara touches her chin thinking about the teachings embedded in being hers. Because of this, positive trees are shipped first. Well, the properties of my energy cause more harm to the surroundings than good. Roxanne didn't deny it, she saw that if someone wanted to create a planet, it would be more logical to send the energy that would feed the planet and then send the negative energy that has more destructive properties. Yes. I have never seen a case where the negative tree was sent first to create a planet. Amara spoke. It was always the positive trees. Following this line of reasoning, we can assume that this imbalance is not healthy. Therefore, should Darling eat more good gods from now on? A balanced diet is always good. Roxanne spoke. Why are you talking as if the gods are snacks for Victor? And isn't that what they are? Roxanne asked confused. Well. Remembering the imposing appearance of Victor's dragon form, and the cosmic horror within him. You are right. While looking at that cosmos without getting closer, Roxanne and Amara realized that those smaller stars were the deities that the gods could sense from Victor if he so desired. Hmm. I have a theory. Come here with me. Amara suddenly flew towards the blank space. Seeing Amara heading towards a deity, Roxanne narrowed her eyes, then quickly followed her sister. Stopping in front of a transparent sphere that looked like a soap bubble, Amara slowly tried to touch it. Wait, what are you doing? Roxanne held Amara's hand. Just an experiment. This is the deepest part of Darling's soul. I won't let you do an experiment here. Roxanne's eyes lit up as she tightened her grip on Amara's hand. Even though her hand was hurting a lot, Amara didn't show it, trust me, I don't want to harm my own planet. If what I have in mind works, it will benefit both of us. Explain what you want to do first. If my hypothesis is correct, that cosmos is the active space of Darling's powers, so if we throw those dormant powers into that space, shouldn't he gain a new deity? Divinity is not cabbage, Amara. You can't win one that easily. Well, that's true. But there's no harm in trying, right? Okay, but don't use the power of the void, it's very dangerous. Power of the void. What were you about to take? Oh. She swallowed and moved away from that transparent sphere. Roxanne looks at some powers nearby, and chooses a golden orb. Looking at the sphere in Roxanne's hand, Amara asked, What is this? Gabriel's essence, it's just pure light energy, it's not harmful to Darling, and even if something happens, it will only heal Darling's soul. Umu, good choice. Amara nodded. The two women fly to the threshold of the two territories again, and upon arrival, Amara looks at her sister with an expectant look. Go on. If this fails, I will blame it on you. Ugh, but you're also participating. But it was your idea. Fine. Just do it. Ha, huh? okay. Roxanne throws the sphere into the cosmos side. The sphere floats for a few seconds without anything happening until... Suddenly, it is pulled by force by a terrible gravitational center and the next moment, the sphere crashes into the white sun. Visibly, the white sun grows a few centimeters, the two wait a few more seconds, and nothing happens. Well, he was fed. Dot. Roxanne was going to say something, but she stopped when she heard her sister scream. Oh, amazing! She looks at her sister, and sees her using the light of angels in her hands. Hey? How can you use this? I don't know, I just feel like I can now, he he he. Chapter 928, Amara and Roxanne. 2. Hey? 
how can you use this? I don't know, I just feel like I can now, he he he. Roxanne narrows her eyes. Wait here. Okay. The next moment, she returns with red power in hand, and then she throws it into the cosmos again. This time there were no seconds of delay, the red sphere flew straight towards the massive red sun, but unlike the minor sun, the supermassive sun did not change. A dark power began to cover Roxanne's body, oh? Interesting, I understand now. What was that sphere? The power of darkness from a shadow demon. And now you can use it. Not just me, darling can also. Amara pouted when she saw the darkness around her sister, because your power is stronger than mine. Probably because my connection with Darling is stronger, my roots are deeply connected to Darling, while you are just a small sprout without roots. Roxanne smiled condescendingly, a smile that greatly irritated Amara. Amara was silent as she gritted her teeth, in the next moment, a white power began to surge out of her body. What are you doing? Merging even more deeply with my planet. Wait, what? Can you merge with Victor consciously? Of course yes, after all, I am an elder tree of positivity not to mention that this ability is a basic ability of positive trees. Within Victor's soul, the roots of the tree of positivity began to go deeper and deeper into his soul until he reached the same place as Roxanne, consequently, deeper and deeper as the roots went. The power of the light of the angels at hand of Amara began to grow stronger, just as the smaller white sun began to grow some more. When the roots reached the same place as Roxanne, Amara reached a point where she could no longer separate herself from Victor. Are you? Are you sure about this? Humph, I won't lose to my younger sister, and whether I like it or not, I know I can't run away from Victor, so this decision is the most sensible. Roxanne twitched her lips, her sister's competitive spirit was too great. Suddenly Amara disappears in a light of angels, and appears again with a white sphere in her hands. Michael's Essentials Roxanne muttered. With this darling will have radiant attributes in his damage, he will burn dark creatures with 100% more damage. Amara throws the sphere into the cosmos, and again the sphere was absorbed by the white sun. Why are you talking like this is an RPG? And why are you calling him darling? Amara ignores Roxanne, and the witness starts laughing, ha 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 ha, this power. Her body is covered in golden flames. Roxanne narrows her eyes, and then looks at the negative powers, and with a wave of her hand, hundreds of powers fly towards the cosmos, even Diablo's body is together. Except for Diablo's body, everything was absorbed by the red sun. Amara remained in disbelieving silence at this absurdity, suddenly a pillar of negative energy explodes from Roxanne. Ha 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 ha, the power. The power. Amara narrows her eyes at this, she didn't like this at all. The next moment, she does the same thing as Roxanne, she takes all the positive attribute spheres and throws them into the white sun. Suddenly the white sun grew several times larger, becoming only slightly smaller than the supermassive red sun. A pillar of pure power came out of Amara's body, and she laughed, ha 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 ha. This feeling of growing power was very exciting. Suddenly the two sisters shivered visibly, and stopped moving, their power also stopped rising in the form of a pillar. Did you feel that? Amara asked. Yes. I felt it. The two looked at each other for a moment and spoke. Fuck. Soon the bodies of the two women were forcibly pulled by the cosmos. Whoa! If I die, I swear I will come back to life to kill you Amara. Don't blame it on me. You were the one who played all the powers like crazy. Bitch dot. Roxanne was going to do something, but her body was absorbed by the red sun. In the next moment, Amara's body was absorbed by the white sun. As this happened, Diablo's body was dissolved in these shocks of power, and became a new small star in the cosmos, at the same time the space delimiting the cosmos from the white space of powers began to shrink. The cosmos quickly began to swallow all the white space, 
taking all the power stored there within itself. Of course, such a change also had an impact on reality. Let's put our cards on the table first. Victor stops talking and opens his eyes widely, suddenly, he touches his chest and makes an expression as if he is in a lot of pain. Victor. Cough. Victor coughed out crimson red blood. Victor. Anna quickly gets off Victor's lap and supports his body, Persephone does the same. Victor speaks in draconic language, release. The closed space that Victor had sealed is released, his consciousness starts to feel heavy, something happened in my body, don't worry, I will go and see what it is. He tried to speak calmly as if nothing had happened, but that only made the girl's expressions even more worried. Soon his consciousness fades. The last thing he sees is the worried screams of the two women. The next moment, he awakens within himself in what appears to be the cosmos, in the distance he can see two gigantic world trees whose branches encompass his entire existence. The core of these gigantic trees appeared to be two supermassive stars, one white and the other red. Victor narrows his eyes when he sees the internal situation of his soul, his non-divine powers were being forced to unite with one of the groups belonging to those two stars, and those powers that came from other sources created new stars in these cosmos. No harmful harm was happening due to the robustness of his soul, and because the two women were protecting him from it, but due to the abrupt change in the basis of his existence, his physical body was harmed which led to him fainting. Something that wasn't a problem either, he could see that his dragon body was already healing the damage, and he was being supported by Amara. Speaking of the two women, Victor looked at Roxanne and Amara de Siza on the ground, the two women's appearance completely changed, specifically their hair, Roxanne's crimson red hair became a hair of pure red energy. Amara's former golden hair was replaced with pure white energy, just like her sister. What did you do? I'm sorry, darling. The two said at the same time while Caesar remained on the ground. What did you do? Victor asked again placing emphasis on every word said. Both of their bodies trembled at Victor's extremely serious tone, he didn't even accept their apologies. This is evil, this is evil. Roxanne was in a cold sweat like a pig waiting to be slaughtered, the only thing she wanted for herself was to make Victor angry with her. Something that is extremely difficult considering who Victor is, someone who takes great care of his family. Fearing this possible future, she wasted no time in throwing her sister under the bus, it was Amara's fault. At As we discussed Anna's potential, I brought her to the deepest side of her soul to show her dormant powers, then she had the brilliant idea of feeding the stars that represented her divinity of begin and negativity. When she saw that we got stronger, and so did you, she dug even deeper into her soul, and started throwing more star powers. Liar. Liar. I only played the power once. You were too excited and ended up throwing more powers. Consequently we ended up being sucked in by the two suns and this happened. She pointed to her changed appearance. We ended up uniting with the two deities. It's your fault. You were the one who had the idea. You threw the most powers. Victor puts his hand on his forehead as he listens to the gya, gya of the two women who were pointing the blame at each other non-stop. Enough. Victor's booming voice echoed around. Hi. They both shivered. Explain from the beginning what happened, and don't lie. The two nodded, and began to talk about what they did. A few minutes after finishing explaining, Victor felt his head throbbing. It seems that bringing Roxanne together with her sister made the woman stupider, Victor takes a deep breath, and decrees. Until I understand the consequence you have done, you are prohibited from going into the depths of my soul. Like a decree given by God, the two's ability to enter the depths of Victor's soul was completely prohibited. Even though they were linked to Victor, this body and soul was still Victor's, therefore he had the greatest authority here. I didn't have access to this place anyway. Amara muttered, for her this punishment wasn't worth much, after all, she could only see Victor's deep soul with Roxanne's permission. What was not the case for Roxanne, for the red woman this punishment was very cruel. Impossible. 
Roxanne said in shock, for her to go to the depths of Victor's soul and rest there, it was one of her greatest pleasures, she liked the welcoming feeling of that place. This is your fault Amara. Roxanne screamed with small tears in her eyes as she began to strangle Amara. Ugh -a 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 -a. Darling is mad at me because of you. Victor ignores the two women for now and spreads his senses throughout his soul, with the knowledge he has gained, he can now better understand his situation. After analyzing the entire state of the soul, he said, I see. By throwing those powers into the suns, they eliminated all traces of mortality from my soul, thus changing the entire internal basis of my soul, and because of this my physical body suffered damage, hey. The point of view becomes higher, and now he can see his entire soul, in total there were three realms now. The kingdom where his powers are located, which was previously his internal world, the kingdom that is the connections he has with other beings and planets and his deepest part of the soul where the physical and spiritual representation of himself was located. Indirectly, these fools helped my progress in my divinity through their silly joke. He also felt that he could use other powers more easily now. He snaps his finger, and a small black hole appears in his hand. Primordial darkness of Erebus, and void. Instead of becoming deities, they became parts of my divinity of negativity. All the powers that are nourished by the negative energy went to the deity of negativity, and all the powers that are nourished by the positive energy went to the deity begin. Victor looked at a star. What is this, he couldn't read that power, despite it being his, he couldn't see the effects it had on himself. But he knew one thing, that star was not a deity, but more of a characteristic. Victor looked at Roxanne and Amara. Do you know what that is? Victor's question makes Roxanne stop giving Amara the rear naked choke, the two sisters look where Victor is pointing. We do not know. The two said in unison. Victor narrows his eyes. From today onwards, do not touch any part of my soul without my express permission, okay? Yes, darling slash Victor. Victor nodded satisfied, although what they did benefited him it still doesn't change the fact that they were playing around with an important part of his existence, any mistake could lead to several problems for him. I will go back, in the meantime learn the changes you made, reflect on what you did wrong, and create another internal world for me. Yes, we will do it. They responded like two kids who were caught doing something stupid. If I see that you haven't learned anything, punishments will be given accordingly. Victor's eyes lit up slightly. Amara and Roxanne just nodded stiffly. When Victor disappeared, Amara and Roxanne were silent. I hope he forgives me. Roxanne sighed. He will forgive you, after all, he loves you. Amara wasn't worried. Idiot, you don't understand, this time darling is really upset, he didn't do anything because he saw that the damage was not great and he benefited but if something like this happens again, you can be sure that he will show no mercy. He won't hit me, or kill me, he doesn't do that, he loves me too much for that, but... He will stop hugging me, spoiling me. For me as his wife it is the worst punishment. Matt, it doesn't make any difference to me. Idiot, it will be worse for you, remember that you are only here recently, he could very well replace you. Amara's face was the opposite. Impossible, he cannot do this, I am deeply bound to him, unless he touches my soul and changes my current ego to one that pleases him. He can control souls, Amara. Amara fell silent, and her face began to noticeably darken. This is bad. I'm fucked. Roxanne nodded. You better behave from now on. Amara agreed. She didn't want to have her ego changed, even if the body was hers, that wouldn't be her. Chapter 929, Persephone and Victor Waking up in reality, the first thing Victor saw was Anna and Persephone's face. How long was I gone? Fifteen minutes. I said it wasn't bad at all. Victor, you are the strongest damn dragon god I have ever seen, your body is practically impenetrable and your regeneration is so perverted, 
and yet you spit out blood. How is that not bad at all? Persephone narrowed her eyes. I didn't even know you could be harmed these days until now. I wasn't hurt, just something that happened related to my soul, and it affected my physical body, something small that has since been fixed. What happened, Victor? Anna asked. My soul went through a cleansing process, and all traces of mortality within my soul completely disappeared, all at the same time. I see, and because of that, your body suffered minor damage. Persephone now understood the cause of Victor's reaction. Basically, his soul was exchanging the mortal pillars for the more robust pillars of a dragon god. This process is typically done slowly, but for some reason, all of this was done at the same time. If Victor's body wasn't so strong, and he had two world trees to support himself, this wouldn't have come out with just a minor damage. Any other normal god would have already died. In a very human way of putting it, it was as if Victor had removed his entire mortal bone structure and replaced it with a divine bone structure all at once. Yes, nothing bad happened. Victor reinforced while making his red blood disappear. Does this now mean that your blood is golden like that of the gods? Anna asked. Not exactly. I am a blood god too, after all, so it can be said that my blood is so thick that it should have turned black. Victor spoke while controlling his own blood, and he materialized it in front of the two. Yeah, it is black blood. Victor nodded when he saw the color of his blood. Persephone and Anna gulped when they saw Victor's blood floating around. It smelled so good and was so rich in nutrients. Victor made a gesture with his hand, and his blood disappeared, making the two women return to their senses. Did you call the other girls? Victor asked. Anna didn't let me leave. Persephone said and then added, she said to trust you. But if thirty minutes had passed, we would have called. M.M., thank you, mother. I don't want to make the girls worry over something small like that. Victor spoke. This isn't a small thing, Victor, it's your safety, Persephone spoke as she narrowed her eyes. Anna nodded in agreement with what Persephone said. Victor just smiled slightly. For me, it's something small. He didn't consider something like his safety important because he knew very well that no matter what happened to him, he would be fine. Even his death is somewhat questionable now, after all. Thanks to the ability he received from the Elder God if he dies from something, he will immediately adapt to that death and come back to life thanks to his other abilities. And even if he could die as a god, he would only remake himself again some thousands of years later. The only possible way to kill Victor now was through his soul or death herself erasing his soul, but for those who tried, this process would be in for a very unpleasant surprise due to the cosmic horror hidden in his soul. Victor didn't know exactly what his abilities were in relation to this creature, but one thing he was sure of was that he wouldn't fall without dragging the enemy with him. And despite still being in a baby state, he is sure that this being can somehow harm a primordial. He just doesn't know how yet. Taking all this into consideration, it is reasonable to say that Victor is physically and spiritually immortal. Therefore, he was not careful about his safety, for him his family's safety was more important. Leaving that small matter aside. It is not a small matter, Anna growled at Victor's lack of regard for himself. Her draconic red eyes glowed slightly as the very surrounding reality shuddered at her words. She didn't like his words at all. As a mother, it was her responsibility to take care of her son, even if technically he was no longer her son, but rather he was her father, it was the feeling that counts. If Victor protected his family, who would protect him? The answer was obvious, his own family, so Anna made a decision. She would ensure that the family was strong enough to support him. She got up from the ground and floated towards the exit in a furious mood. In the face of this anger, the reality around her seemed to fail a little. Victor, seal my rune ability and allow me to use it only when I am near you. Are you sure? Yes there is no point in having a power that I cannot control. Very well. Victor nodded and spoke in draconian language. 
Anna's runic power will be sealed and will only be released when she is by my side. In the next moment, the effects of Anna's anger actually began to disappear completely, but her mood and the brightness in her eyes did not diminish in the slightest. She was determined and angry. Upon leaving the room, the doors were closed, leaving Persephone and Victor alone. What was that? Persephone asked, confused. I woke up a dragon. Victor laughed. His words weren't an exaggeration. Anna, up until now, had always acted as second in command when he, Violet, Sasha, Ruby, Natasha, Scathatch, Aphrodite, Kagaya, or Agnes weren't present, but she always did it as a last option, and not willingly. You could say that this was her job, so she took on everything and gained a lot of experience from it, but now. It seemed that this would no longer be a reality. She would not act as a backup leader and would actively meddle in faction-related things. That's interesting. I wonder what changes this will bring. Anna was highly respected within Victor's inner circle, not just because she was Victor's mother but also because of the fact that despite being a brutally honest woman, she was very competent and got along well with everyone. She was not a social butterfly like Aphrodite who could make even the quietest of women like Eve talk, but she had around her the power of honesty that, even though it was disabled, would work unconsciously, making people feel comfortable with her. Putting all these facts together, Anna was undoubtedly very respected, and seeing her acting proactively to boost the girls, interesting changes will occur. And due to Violet's recent changes, Victor suspected that she and Anna would work together to make all these changes happen. Waking a dragon. Well, you could say that. Do you plan to make her a wife? Persephone asked. It is worth mentioning that she was a goddess and not just any goddess, a Greek goddess, and the concept of limits does not exist for these gods. To that question, Victor just gave Persephone a neutral smile and didn't respond immediately. He picked up Persephone and placed her on his lap. He stroked the goddess of the underworld and spring's long black hair, then pushed her face into her chest. Persephone's black dragon horns scratched Victor's face a little but didn't do any damage. Persephone took a deep breath, smelling Victor, and her body began to react to smelling his body. This was the scent of her progenitor, this was the scent of Victor. This was the scent of the man she wanted for herself but could not have due to Aphrodite's intrusion and her own stupidity. Persephone was embarrassed when remembering her actions in the past. Due to her work as ruler and queen of the underworld, she was forced to mature faster, not that she wasn't mature before, after all, she already had children at that time, but her attitude was very naive, stupid, not ripe. For someone of her status. Well, they say that the gods take thousands of years to mature. A good example of this was the dead god King Zeus himself, who did not mature even until the end of his life. Mortals say that responsibility helps people mature, but this was different from person to person, responsibility only made Zeus act more recklessly than before, and the same happened with Poseidon. Now that she thinks about it, the Greek gods were no different from humans. It could be said that they were the perfect representation of what humans would do if they were not limited by the laws of society. Knowing humans, they could act even worse than gods and demons combined. While Persephone was lost in thought, accepting Victor's caresses and smelling him. Victor, who was silent, began to speak. I don't plan on doing anything, Persephone. Hmm. Persephone stopped thinking and looked at Victor. What do you mean? Exactly what I meant. Victor caressed Persephone's cheeks and made her look up. I don't plan to do anything. I will let everything happen naturally, just like it happened before. The only difference is that I won't refuse anything. Persephone narrowed her eyes slightly and said with an amused smile, You are a jerk. Oh. You're not giving anyone a choice. You're giving a false sense of choice, but I know that from the moment you turned them into dragons, you won't let any of them get away, including Anna, Carmilla, Nady, and Hestia, who aren't exactly related to you. Manipulation 101 at its best. 
she snorted. Interesting. You didn't put your name. Humph, I'm not included in that anymore. The proof of that is the way we are now, I'm not stupid. I can see your intentions crystal clear. Had. Victor's eyes sparkled in amusement as his crimson, violet eyes focused on Persephone's face, in that case, tell me. What are my intentions with you? Chapter 930, Persephone and Victor 2. Persephone adjusts herself on Victor's lap, she stands up a little, and then sits on her lap, then she adjusts her long black hair, throwing it back, and places both hands on Victor's shoulder. You want to possess me? Persephone's black eyes glowed slightly. I can clearly feel your desire to conquer me. She leans towards him and her face is inches away from each other. Ever since you turned me into a dragon, and brought me here, I could clearly feel your desire for me. She caressed Victor's cheeks in a very loving way. That's not all. You want to avoid loose ends. What do you mean? Don't play dumb, it doesn't look good on you. She kisses his cheek, and then starts licking it towards his neck, when she smells his neck. Her eyes shine blood red for a few seconds, but she doesn't bite, she knows that if she does that, she it would just break her tooth. Her body began to heat up even more when she felt Victor's hands running down her body and slowly moving towards her buttocks, she let out hot air from her nose when she felt a large member pressing against her entrance. She was literally burning inside, her dragon fire was so hot that it was affecting her slightly. I am the ruler of hell. She takes a deep breath. Just like an ancient queen, you want me at your side both to ensure you don't have to seek another ruler and to ensure your rule. All the upper levels of management of your faction will be done by your wives, this way, you avoid corruption, and exercise total control over everything. As expected. Persephone smiled slightly. Of course I do, don't underestimate me, I was a queen, I know how you think. You are very foolish. Persephone's face twitched slightly when she heard Victor's response. Victor grabs a nice bunch of Persephone's long hair, and pulls her back making her look at himself. Persephone's insides tightened at this sudden movement, and she breathed more deeply in desire, but despite being very hot, and wanting to do spicier things, she couldn't ignore Victor's words. Why did he call me a fool? She thought in confusion. Control? Corruption? None of that matters. Who am I, Persephone? Victor. A dragon god of chaos. She opened her eyes slightly when she understood what he meant. Exactly, my own name gives me control, my own power gives me control, if I so wish, with just one word, I can delete my hell from existence. No one in hell will dare act against me because they know the consequence they know the fear. Victor's face trembled slightly, showing a distorted appearance, an appearance that was only shown in the blink of an eye, just as they also know that by behaving and being a good citizen, they will be rewarded. Do you know why I turned you into a dragon? It wasn't anything extravagant for something like control, or for political support, it's something much simpler than that, something more primitive. Victor pushes Persephone to the floor and instead of her falling onto a hard floor and hearing a crash destroying everything, she fell onto a soft mattress that by some miracle supported her weight. At some point, she was also completely without clothes just being the way she came into the world, she felt a hard member near her flooded cave that with just one thrust she would be completely ravaged. Small details she didn't care about as much now as she looked into Victor's lifeless, possession-filled eyes. You are mine. I won you over. I stole your kingdom, your soldiers, and made you mine. Therefore you will not run away. Is it that simple? Persephone spoke in disbelief. I am a dragon, Persephone. I take whatever I want. Nyx submitted to me, therefore she is mine. Gaia was defeated by me, therefore she is mine. Hestia is Hestia. The goddesses fled the Greek pantheon and went to my faction, consequently, they submitted to me and they became mine. The gods I defeated and took as my slaves. 
my student who is managing my religion, and my dear most loyal believers who pray to me every day. They are all mine. The possessiveness in Victor's tone actually scared Persephone a little now, but at the same time that it scared her it also made her very wet because her very nature was fascinated by the power gushing from his words, and due to their past history together, these feelings were driven even further. Victor's tone eased a little, and he commented, but although these others are mine, only few can feel my touch and affection, few can be called my wives, and have the privilege of being a dragon. True. It wasn't Victor who should fight for women to get their attention. It is the women who must fight for him to get his attention. He is the biggest prize, he is the strongest, the most beautiful, the craziest, the most insane, the most loving, the most possessive, he is the dragon god of chaos, leader of the faction of new gods the dragon nest. And because of our history Persephone, you have earned this privilege. Victor gently touched Persephone's face as her crimson-violet eyes glowed with possession, desire, gentleness, and love. I'm sorry for making you suffer for me, but you deserved it. Persephone was incredulous, was this any way to ask for forgiveness? She didn't know what to say now, just Victor was such a confused man that at one moment he is completely insane, at another moment he is completely kind, and at the same time sarcastic. But she really hated herself for feeling her heart beat faster when she heard the words I'm sorry coming from Victor, like many women out there, she had selective hearing, and only cared about the first half of Victor's sentence. I'm sorry for not paying attention to you, but you were a complete bitch in the past, at least your suffering gave you character development. Persephone's eyes started to get more teary, she had several complaints she wanted to make now mainly related to the way Victor apologized to her, but she didn't care now, her happy feelings completely overpowered all these confusing feelings. All she cared about now was Victor's intentions in saying those words, even though it was confusing, and at the same time he wasn't completely apologizing, she understood that he was wanting her for himself, something she had always wanted. I. When Victor was about to say something more, Persephone wrapped both arms around her neck and kissed him while her voluptuous body was practically glued to Victor's body, it was as if she wanted to merge with him. They spent a few minutes kissing as if they wanted to imprint their entire being on each other. Ah, finally, he is mine. The dragon goddess didn't care about anything else now, she dedicated this entire moment to him, her entire existence was his now, in life and death, forever and ever. Her soul began to be linked with Victor in a soul marriage in the same way as it happened with Aphrodite. Stopping kissing Victor, she looked possessively at him with eyes full of love and desire. Hush, darling. Just fuck me, make me forget everything. I thought you would never say that, honey. Victor smiled widely as with one thrust he filled her completely. Yes. Soon bangs began to be heard in the mansion. Victor's inner world. Hmm. Roxanne looked with teary eyes at the kingdom of Victor's connections, and saw a new island appearing next to Aphrodite's, the island was strange, the island had an atmosphere of eternal spring, but at the same time it had a dark part representing something similar with the underworld. Ah. Suddenly something clicked in Roxanne's head as she understood what happened, Darling got married again. Roxanne tried to open her connection to Victor to see what he was doing, but she couldn't. After all, she is grounded for the stupid thing she did. Seeing that she couldn't completely connect with Victor, tears began to fall from Roxanne's eyes. Stop crying, Roxanne. Amara appeared beside her with a beam of white light, her long hair made of pure white energy floated around in a mesmerizing manner. But I can't fully connect with Darling like I used to. He banned me. This is all your fault. Amara rolled her eyes, every time she met Roxanne, she made a point of blaming her since she was the one who exaggerated in the process. Stop blaming me. I didn't do everything alone, you did too, so it's not just my fault. It's ours. Ugh. Roxanne grumbled as she wiped her face. Anyway, what is this? Amara pointed to the new island that suddenly appeared. Darling made a soul marriage. 
Based on her characteristics, it must be Persephone. A soul marriage. That which can only be done by two gods. Amara asked as she tried to search her memories where she heard those words before, she remembers it was in some conversation with her older sisters. A god can do this involuntarily too, for example, a woman can promise a man that she will always be his, or a man can promise a woman that he will always be hers, and vice versa, the minimum requirement for this to happen is to be a god, after all, only gods have the slightest access to the system. Due to the situation of Victor who has several wives, and he is the strongest, the ones who perform the soul marriage are the wives, and not Victor himself, because of this, a part of the wife's soul appears here in this place. Roxanne explained in a monotonous way, despite being a little depressed now, she still played her role as an older sister, although technically speaking Amara is the older sister, but since Roxanne matured into a mature form first, that position was taken by Roxanne. Hmm, isn't that unfair? Just the wives doing it? Amara asked. Well, darling is the biggest prize. Roxanne didn't think it was unfair considering Victor's status, not to mention that as the strongest in the case of a possible death, the wives will be protected with the trace of their souls stored in Victor's soul. Amara looked deeply at those islands floating next to each other, suddenly a light bulb flashed in her head. I had an idea. She looked at Roxanne with an excited face. Roxanne on the other hand looked at her sister suspiciously. Amara didn't care about this look and said, if my idea works, we can easily earn Darling's forgiveness. Roxanne's eyes sparkled slightly in excitement, but she wouldn't fall into Amara's traps, she would listen to her idea first. Tell me your idea. Due to Darling's authority as a god of the highest hierarchy in terms of divinity, it is quite easy for him to perform a soul marriage with his wife, so what we can do is advise him to do this, we can also assist him. Him in this. By marrying all his wives in this way, he will be happy and forgive me. This is a good idea. Roxanne smiled excitedly. Forgive you s, don't forget me. Amara grumbled. Whatever. Roxanne snorted. Veins popped in Amara's head. Oh yes? In that case, do it all by yourself, I bet you can easily do it. She snorted. Roxanne didn't react to Amara's words immediately, only when she thought about this specific topic and realized that she had no idea what to do that she said. Wait, wait. Do you know how to do this? Of course I know, unlike you who are a lonely world tree, I have contact with my other older sisters, they taught me some tricks. Amara boasted. Roxanne didn't care about Amara's attack. She didn't care about other bitches as long as she had Victor by her side. Tell me how to do this. Humph, I won't. Amara snorted, and then started to run, but stopped immediately when she heard what Roxanne said. Wait, sister. I'm sorry. Roxanne bit her lip, she knew she was acting very petty towards Amara due to several feelings involved mainly the feeling of not wanting to share space with her not to mention that she also didn't want to take the blame for the previous incident. I really apologize. Please help me with this, I don't want to go another moment without feeling darling. Promise you'll try to treat me better. Yes, I promise. I'll try not to be too mean with you. Roxanne promised. Hmm. Amara looked at Roxanne neutrally, trying to look for any deception coming from her sister but soon she sighed resignedly. Fine, I will teach you, and we can do it with darling. Yay. Thank you, sis. Roxanne hugged her. Whatever. She snorted, she still didn't feel satisfied, but as an older sister, she has to take care of her younger sister, even if she was annoying sometimes. Chapter 931, A Broken Power Tink, tink. Tink. Rumble, rumble. Sounds of thunderous rumbling and metals colliding echoed around. In the sky, five blonde-haired women with similar expressions were engaged in a battle. Clearly, these women were related to each other. Some would say they represented three generations of women from the same clan, 
all fighting. You're using too much energy, Sasha, Carmilla spoke while hovering in the air, her eyes as well as her dragon horns gleaming with her lightning power. She was clearly fully charged and brimming with power. Another thundering rumble was heard, and in the next moment, lightning clashed with Carmilla, an ear-piercing ring echoing out from the impact. Sasha appeared in front of Carmilla, resembling Carmilla's appearance, with the only difference being that her arms and legs were covered in yellow lightning energy. Despite the sounds of metals clashing, the women of the Fulger clan were not using weapons to fight but rather their own hands, which were more powerful than most weapons out there. As it was only joint training to get accustomed to their power, there was no need to take it too seriously. But that wasn't what the other Fulger clan women thought. Lightning began to gather near Sasha's chest and Carmilla raised an eyebrow as she felt this powerful energy. In the next moment, she grabbed Sasha's hand, spun her around, and threw the girl away. Sasha adjusted her center of gravity as denser lightning began to cover her body, and the weather around her began to change due to the electricity. Sasha's features began to distort and become wilder as golden dragon scales appeared around her neck, and her mouth opened unnaturally wide, revealing her sharp teeth. Golden dragon wings appeared behind her as if they were there to further adjust her center of gravity. You're all so competitive. Well, you are my descendants, so, of course, you are, Carmilla laughed, and just like Sasha, her body was covered in power, her features beginning to transform, and pure power began to form in her chest as well. The way Carmilla processed the transformation faster demonstrated her expertise in controlling her body. Even though she now existed in a completely different form than before, the millennia of training in her previous body had not been in vain, and her experience was invaluable. Yet, even though Sasha didn't have that, she had something else. Pure potential. In the next moment, two dragon roars were heard, followed by massive beams of pure plasma. Yes, yes. It's here. The power struggle, Lacus. Pepper jumped excitedly. Yes, yes, amazing, Lacus responded in a monotone tone to Pepper's enthusiasm. The power struggle. Yes, yes. Power struggle. I get it already, God damn it! Lacus stomped her foot in irritation, causing a small earthquake around her. Unfortunately, Contrary to what Pepper, Sienna, and Lacus expected, there was no power struggle. As the two beams of power collided, they completely cancelled each other out and only caused a deafening explosion of lightning and thunder. Impossible. There was no power struggle. I even prepared my controller to rotate the analog stick. Pepper spoke while displaying her console controller. Where did you get that? Sienna asked curiously as she hadn't seen Pepper with her belongings or her usual bag. I made it, Pepper said as if it were something simple to do, which, in the case of true dragons, was indeed simple, as the language of dragons in rune form came naturally to them. The only difference was that some had more talent for it than others. However, without exception, all true dragons could easily use the beginner level of this power. But since they had only just turned into dragons a few hours ago, and Pepper was already using this power, it showed her potential in this art. Although this potential was not the same as Anna's, who had struggled to control her power and needed to be sealed by Victor until she could get used to it. How did you do that? Sienna asked curiously. Hmm. I just thought about what I wanted to create, and I said it out loud. I felt my energy levels decreasing, and suddenly, what I said appeared. Despite Pepper's explanation being quite confusing, Sienna fully understood what she meant. Although they weren't geniuses like Ruby, the Scarlet Sisters were not incompetent. You don't become one of Skathika's daughters without having some kind of talent. And as sisters who had known each other for a long time, they understood each other completely. Apple Sienna felt her energy decreasing, and in the next moment, a red apple, just as she had imagined, appeared in her hand. Why an apple? Lacus asked, puzzled. Couldn't she have created anything else? 
I've always wanted to try this fruit. After all, it's red like us. Sienna opened her mouth and bit into the fruit with her sharp teeth. Hmm. It tastes like nothing. That's because you don't know the taste of a real apple, Rose interjected into the group. As the oldest dragon present, she was here to help the other girls with their own understanding. Our control over creation depends entirely on our perspective of reality, which is why your apple has no taste, she explained. I see. Sienna said. Hmm. Lakas opened her hand and said, Strawberry. In the next moment, several strawberries appeared in Lakas's hand. She smiled faintly and said, Try them, Pepper, Sienna, handing the fruits to her sisters. Sienna looked at Lakas suspiciously. As the older sister, she was well aware of Lakas's mischievous side. On the other hand, Pepper didn't suspect a thing and simply ate without thinking much. Pepper opened her eyes wide and then blushed slightly as she looked at Lakas. Lakas. You. How is it? It's delicious, isn't it? Lakas asked with the same smile on her face. Mm, Pepper nodded, her face blushing even more. She never thought her sister could be so naughty. She expected this kind of behavior from Natasha, Nadie, Roberta, Maria, Agnes, or Violet, but not from her sister. Sienna narrowed her eyes suspiciously but also curiously. She looked at the strawberry and then ate it. In the next moment, just like Pepper, she opened her eyes wide and blushed a bit. You pervert. She accused. Lakas just smiled and didn't say anything, as if she had done nothing wrong. Curious about what they were talking about, Rose took some strawberries from Sienna's hand and ate them, too. Unlike the Scarlet Sisters, who reacted intensely, she just raised an amused eyebrow. The taste of Victor's seed, hey. That's a rather creative way to use this power. Our control over creation depends entirely on our perspective of reality, Lakas repeated Rose's words with a cunning smile. That means I can make a strawberry taste like any flavor I want. But if the strawberry doesn't taste like strawberry, is it still a strawberry? Wouldn't it just be a new food shaped like a strawberry? Pepper asked. It just wouldn't be a strawberry, right? Not exactly. Since Lakas doesn't know the taste of a strawberry, she can improvise with her own perspective and imagination. In a way, it wouldn't be wrong because, from her point of view, that's how a strawberry should be, Rose explained. This power is quite dangerous, Sienna narrowed her eyes. If we're not careful, we can cause irreversible damage. That's why Darling is personally taking care of Anna. He's the only one who won't be affected by her powers since he's too strong for that, Scathatch said as she walked toward her daughters. Without saying anything, she took the strawberry from Lakas's hand and swallowed it. Mm, delicious, she displayed a satisfied and somewhat indecent smile. Sienna, Lakas, and Pepper just stared at their mother incredulously but they shook their heads as if they had no choice. Several thunderous noises were heard again, this time a bit closer to them. The group looked up and saw Carmilla in the middle, dealing with Sasha, Natasha, Nadie, and Victoria. Even in a four-on-one situation with all her opponents being dragons, with Carmilla's experience, she was holding up quite well. Though, she was clearly being pressured, she had completely stopped talking to focus on the fight. The five women disappeared again, leaving behind lightning trails, and clashed in the middle of the arena. The fight was so fast that if it weren't for the dragon's abnormal senses, the spectators wouldn't have been able to even see what was happening. And even for Scat Hatch, she wouldn't be an exception because, due to race change, the women of the Fulger clan had become even faster capable of making several moves in less than a second. For example, when Carmilla, Victoria, Nady, Natasha, and Sasha clashed again, Sasha attacked Carmilla's face with her claws, who defended the attack before retaliating, only to miss as Sasha dodged the blow and moved away by kicking Carmilla's stomach. Next, Natasha came from behind and attacked with her lightning claws, causing damage to Carmilla. The older woman growled, turned around, 
and punched her daughter's face before disappearing to attack Nady, who was approaching from the other side. But while she was focused on Nady, Victoria came from the side and tried to kick her back. Sensing danger, Carmilla threw herself forward, avoiding the attack and falling to the ground while supporting herself with her hands, then attacking Nady's face with her feet. All of these moves happened in less than a second. The Fulger clan was putting into practice what great warriors always said, that one second was enough to completely change the rhythm of the battle. With their current speed, the girls had their own fighting rhythm, and just with this speed, they were superior to many other beings out there, even their own sisters. After all, the Fulger clan not only had absurd speed but also the explosive physical power of true dragons. If this planet weren't strengthened by Darling, I would really think this place could be destroyed, Agnes couldn't help but say, catching everyone's attention. Currently, Agnes, Rose, Scat Hatch, Eleanor, Violet, Natasha, Sasha, Carmilla, Victoria, Nady, Sienna, Lacus, and Pepper were training in this Colosseum specifically designed by Victor to withstand the power of a dragon. The Fulger, Snow, Scarlet, and Adristella clans were participating in the joint training in this arena, while the other girls and goddesses were in different arenas. Due to being different beings, the goddesses were in a separate arena that was even more resistant than this one. After all, they weren't just ordinary goddesses but dragon goddesses, so their powers were elevated to the maximum. I don't think this planet can be so easily destroyed. You can feel it, right? Eleanor said. Yes. Agnes nodded when she understood what Eleanor was talking about. As a dragon, they could all tell just how strong this planet was, and from what they could feel emanating from its center, the amount of energy sustaining this planet was surreal. Carmilla is certainly astute, Scathatch said after observing the Fulger clan's fight for a few minutes. What do you mean, mother? Sienna asked. I'm talking about her using her descendants to recover her ancient instincts while also helping them get used to their bodies. Hmm, is she really that strong? I know she's Natasha's mother, but she's barely fighting back in the battle. Carmilla is older than me, you know. Scathatch smiled. She belongs to the ancient generation of vampire counts, and unlike the current generation that kind of inherited the title, Carmilla had to fight against several other elder vampires from the past who weren't weak. Not to mention, she never completely stopped training. Even if she couldn't get stronger due to her body's limitations, her techniques weren't stagnant. Just think of me, but a bit older who never stopped training but couldn't train like me because of her responsibilities. Scathatch wasn't exaggerating, just stating facts. Although Carmilla never stopped training, she had to divide her time between leading the clan and handling the clan's growing businesses from the past. Because of this, she never had the opportunity to fully focus on her training. However, she never completely abandoned it. Just because of this, she was already better than many lazy noble vampires out there. After speaking so much, the Scarlet Sisters had no choice but to watch Carmilla, as Scathatch rarely praised someone's abilities as she did now. The last time she did so was with Victor, and everyone knows what kind of monster he has become. As for her not being able to fight back completely. Well, isn't that normal? After all, her daughters and granddaughter aren't weak. With the improvement brought by the race change, it's quite surprising that she can still handle her four descendants, Scathatch said. Don't forget the fact that she also has the experience of observing Natasha, Rose added. Indeed, Scathatch nodded. That's why I say combat experience is quite important, Rose said. Correct, Scathatch nodded again. But what about Victor? He wasn't exactly experienced when he destroyed a pantheon, right? Pepper asked innocently. Rose and Scathatch's faces twitched slightly. Don't use Victor as your marker for common sense. Besides, even someone experienced can't deal with a power that's superior, Rose said. M.M., as expected of Darling, he's the strongest, Pepper nodded in satisfaction. Chapter 932, 
I am always watching. She won't use her daggers. Rose asked as she watched the fight. Not during this training, I think. Scat Hatch said, after all, the goal is to get used to their bodies. Too bad, I wanted to see the state of her technique, Rose spoke. I don't think she's a grandmaster like us, but she's at the master's limit. She just needs enlightenment to get to grandmaster. Even though Carmila was very talented, grandmaster was not achieved with talent alone, enlightenment was also necessary. Of course, this is just speculation on my part. Let's fight her later, Rose spoke. That's a good idea. Let's include Agnes, Natasha, and Nady too. Hey! Don't put me in a fight without my permission. Agnes growled. Eh? Don't you want to struggle to get used to your body? I mean, it's not that I didn't want to. I just don't want you to decide things for me. Agnes spoke. Scat Hatch rolled her eyes. Stop being dramatic, woman, and just accept it. It seems that turning into a dragon made her more temperamental, Rose commented. Agnes growled at these two women as the temperature around her began to rise and become unbearable. Ignoring the angry dragon near them, Scat Hatch spoke, Well, it's not like I can't understand. The Snow Clan has always had trouble controlling their emotions and are very emotional beings. As dragons now, those emotions have been heightened to the ninth power. Basically, they became more emotional, like a virgin girl about to have her first PMS. With the only difference being that they are always stuck in that state. Yes. Scat Hatch nodded while ignoring Agnes' gaze. Although. This doesn't apply to everyone in the Snow Clan. Scat Hatch thought as he looked at Violet. Since the woman became a dragon, she has been very controlled, remarkably different from her mother. It's as if she already knows what to do. Even the draconic instincts don't seem to affect her as much as her mother's. Hum dot. Violet, who was still smiling sweetly as she watched everything, suddenly looked at Eleanor. Her draconic eyes narrowed slightly like a reptile, and her smile became more cunning. Currently, all the girls present here were wearing simple gym clothes, and although these clothes looked simple, they were made by Skathika's runes so their durability was guaranteed. Eleanor, Eleanor, are we going to fight? Violet spoke to Eleanor like a friend who was asking her best friend to go shopping or something. Eleanor, who had her arms crossed under her chest, looked at Violet, her neon green dragon eyes narrowed slightly in distrust. She seemed to think about some things, and then her eyebrow raised, showing interest, sure. Soon, she walked toward the middle of the arena. Yay dot. Violet laughed lightly and walked towards the arena. The two women stood in the middle of the arena, looking at each other. No powers, okay? Just martial arts. Oh? Very well. Not only did Eleanor show interest in what Violet said, but Scat Hatch, Rose, the Scarlet Sisters, and Agnes were also interested. Everyone here knew that Violet's trump card was her explosive power, not her technique. Violet looks at her hand and mutters something in the draconic language. Iron Ball. The surrounding dragonesses just raised their eyebrows at Violet's casual gesture. It was as if she was very used to doing what she was doing. It was at that moment that Agnes narrowed her eyes in distrust and looked into Violet's eyes. She was so excited about becoming more powerful and having her powers expanded to a ridiculous degree that she completely forgot that the same thing happened to her daughter. Not only did her fire powers get stronger, but the powers she inherited from her father probably got stronger, too. When the iron ball appeared in her hand, she looked at Eleanor and said, As soon as this ball touches the ground, we start. Okay. Remember. Just close combat martial arts, no weapons, and no powers. I got it. Good. Violet threw the iron ball upwards, then gravity did its work, and it fell to the ground, making a small bang when it landed. At that moment, Eleanor vanished and appeared in front of Violet, attacking her. Since Violet wasn't proficient in martial arts like her, 
and she couldn't control her strength completely yet, she tried to take it easy. Violet dodged Eleanor's right blow that was aimed at her face, and a blast of air appeared behind Violet, but it didn't destroy anything due to the durability of the arena. Maintaining the position she was in, Violet punched Eleanor with her left hand. Eleanor dodged the attack and heard several loud bangs behind her, followed by an intense blast of air. Unlike Eleanor, Violet wasn't holding back. Eleanor moved away from Violet and raised her eyebrow at the woman. Faced with that look, Violet just replied, I asked for a fight, Eleanor. Not a spar. Very well. I won't hold back either. Good. Violet smiled slightly. The two women looked at each other for a few seconds, in the next moment, they disappeared and clashed in the middle of the arena. Soon, an intense exchange of blows began to take place without the two leaving their place. The blows were exchanged at high speed, Violet attacking as Eleanor defended and dodged, the same happening when Eleanor attacked Violet. With each blow, loud bangs were heard, but the women didn't move much like they did during the Fulger fight. Just like Violet said in the beginning, they were just using their physical prowess and their martial arts. Faced with this conflict, even the women of the Fulger clan stopped fighting and looked at the scene with slight shock. The problem with the girl's vision was not the fight itself but Violet's performance fighting with Eleanor. Eleanor was definitely more experienced in fighting than Violet. After all, she had been fighting all her life, not to mention that she was personally trained by Scat Hatch. Of the younger heirs, Eleanor was without a doubt the strongest, and yet... Violet was matching her with martial arts? What's going on here? Was Violet so proficient in martial arts? Sasha asked aloud as she wiped the dirt off her face. The women looked in Skathika's direction, and Agnes, as far as they knew, the two of them, along with Victor, were the only ones who trained Violet. Feeling the women's gazes, Skathatch spoke, I only trained Violet in the basics. Most of her training was done by Agnes and Victor. The woman's gaze went to Agnes. I taught her the martial arts of the Snow Clan, but... Our martial art is mainly focused on the use of our powers and the sword. It is not an art like Scat Hatch. These movements, even I didn't know that she could do it. So that leaves us just one person, Victoria spoke. Victor. They all said at the same time. At that moment, the girls looked at Sasha, after all, they all knew that Victor had personal training only with Ruby, Violet and Sasha in the past. The last training Darling had with us, he trained us on how to refine our powers. My case was turning lightning into plasma. In Violet's case, it was like making a fire hotter. In Ruby's case, it was the water changing its shape and controlling the enemy's body using the water inside the body, as well as exploding the enemy's body. Pepper raised an eyebrow when she heard the final part. As someone who also had the same water powers as Ruby, she pouted. Why didn't he teach me that too? I want to explode enemies' bodies like a necromancer. What does a necromancer have to do with the body exploding? Nady asked, confused. Idiot Nady has everything to do with it. You really are uncultured. Pepper said. Veins popped in Nady's head when she heard what Pepper said. Ignoring what the two discussed, Sasha continued, although he trained us in martial arts together with Ruby, that was not the main focus of the training. The women looked back at Violet and Eleanor's duel, just like before, they still didn't leave their place. Rose, Scat Hatch and Carmilla narrowed their eyes slightly at what was happening. They somehow felt that something very unnatural was happening in front of them now, their instincts were telling them so, but they couldn't tell what was wrong. No matter what Eleanor did, Violet defended and counterattacked as if she knew what kind of move Eleanor was going to make next. When this thought appeared in the minds of the three most experienced women in martial arts present, the three of them opened their eyes slightly in shock. Don't tell me. The three thought at the same time. Her suspicions became real when Eleanor suddenly tripped Violet, and the woman just jumped before the blow happened and kicked Eleanor in the face, pushing the woman away slightly. 
What Violet did just now was impossible for someone who didn't have lesser time perception and was fast enough like the women of the Fulger clan. She's wearing that, isn't she? Agnes grumbled. Yes. Carmilla, Scathatch, and Rose confirmed at the same time. Eleanor growled at Violet when she realized what she was doing. Violet, you said without powers. I'm not using my powers, Violet replied calmly. Liar, you are clearly using your future vision. I am not. Then how do you explain this? How do you know exactly every single thing I'm going to do? That's because Eleanor, I already know everything you are going to do. See. You are using your powers. I am not. Violet shakes her head. Do you not trust my words? Do you think I would lie to you about something I agreed to do? Eleanor was silent, Violet can be many things, but when she says she is going to do something, she really does it. She was not disloyal to the people she liked. So, explain what this is? How did you become so proficient in martial arts? Observing, imagining, and applying. Hey! Violet touched her head. Our brains are much faster and more efficient than our previous brain, Eleanor. All I did was use it. Violet's eyes turned to the girls, and a sickly smile appeared on her face. I've always been very observant, you know? Always watching, always keeping an eye on what kind of women approached my darling. Violet's eyes faintly glowed neon violet, combining this information with what I've learned from using my eyes, it's no exaggeration to say that I know everything about you. Pepper unconsciously stood behind Lacus. Violet is scarier than before. She muttered. Lacus and Sienna can't help but agree with their younger sister. So how exactly does this work? Do you see our future or something? Sasha asked. Nat, I just saw your whole past, Violet spoke neutrally as she looked at her nails. These words left the girls completely silent, an uncomfortable silence. She blows on her nails and flames come out of her mouth. When the flames stopped coming out of her mouth, she nodded, satisfied when she saw her nails shining. When I became a dragon, my eyes became even more powerful, and now I can not only see the future, but I can also see the past. Specifically speaking, I can see the past of something. This action comes instinctively to me and does not harm me or the world around me. After all, the past is already written. Using this tool, I observed Eleanor and learned everything about her. Using my superior brain, I simplified her habits into everything. She looked back at Eleanor as she smiled gently. I know exactly every action that Eleanor will take in the fight. I know that she tends to use her hands when she is fighting at close range. I know that she has the habit of leaning more on the right side of her body. I know when she sees an opportunity she always tends to use her strongest punches. Which usually tend to be blows to places that can kill, like the head or heart. The arteries would also apply, but since we are a family, she won't fight me like that. When she is frustrated or in a hurry, she tends to attack with the great sword to kill the enemy. If such a thing happens in a fight between the family, she will try to take down the opponent like what happened now. The silence continued but this time, the silence was one of disbelief, a frightening silence. Isn't this completely broken? Pepper couldn't help but speak. Well, I'm the Empress, I need to know what kind of bitch is in a relationship with my husband. Violet thought as she continued smiling. It was probably this power that allowed me to interact with my past self. Although I must be more proficient with it in the future to interact with the past. Violet thought. She now understood what her future self meant when she said that she wasn't ready yet. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the outcome of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but do not know the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will lose every battle. Sun Tzu. I'm just applying this teaching to reality quite directly, if I must say. She laughed. 
Snapping out of her stupor at this absurd power, Scathatch began to think, and it took no less than five seconds to fully understand the pros and cons of this power. I see. You can know everything about a being's past, but that doesn't mean you get stronger or anything. For example, even if you know me intimately and know what kind of attack I'm going to make, you will still lose against me. Exactly. There is also the fact that you have learned countless other martial arts, so my prediction becomes more difficult to make. Violet nodded. On the other hand, beings like Eleanor, who tend to rely on a single martial art, are easier to predict, Scathatch spoke. And since you have strength similar to hers due to turning into a dragon, the fight kind of evens out. True. Violet nodded, but if I faced Rose, she would still slice me into pieces because even though I know where the attack is coming from, I couldn't defend. Although all these disadvantages apply because of your level of strength, if you become stronger, in all the hundred battles you fight, you will have the advantage against the enemy and can cause damage not only physically but also emotionally. Emotional harm. Pepper asked. Idiot Pepper, didn't you hear what she said? She knows the entire past of a being. That means she can provoke the being in the middle of battle, shaking their emotions. Lakas spoke. Exactly. Scathatch nodded. That's a terrible power to have. I'm glad you're not my enemy. Scathatch sighed. After all, she knew very well that with this kind of power, Violet didn't even need to fight her directly to defeat her, she could use the information she knew to harm her. Scathatch could defeat this enemy, but the damage caused by them might never be undone. So, let's continue. Violet asked Eleanor. Eleanor felt quite reluctant to fight Violet now. Violet smiled sweetly. Think of it as a form of training. After all, you shouldn't be so predictable in battle. This is also training to improve my martial arts. Although Darling and Scathatch taught me the basics, I want to improve more. Fine, Eleanor grumbled. Violet took her stand, same rules as before, just martial arts. Okay. Chapter 933, A Just God A man with nine tails slowly opened his groggy eyes. What? What's happening? Hey, you, you're finally awake. The nine-tailed man, clearly a yukai, quickly jumped up from the ground and assumed a defensive stance. As he did so, he noticed a group of people. A well-dressed man, a woman with short blonde hair, a tall man who clearly smelled like a vampire, and another blonde man who also smelled like a vampire, but unlike the tall man, this man appeared to be a noble vampire. What's your name, stranger? The same well-dressed man asked in a monotone voice. Why should I tell you? Because if you're here, it means you're somehow connected to Victor Alucard. And when I say connected, I mean you've done harm to someone close to him. The nine-tailed yukai shivered when he heard the man's words. Hmm, seeing that you're not saying anything, we'll introduce ourselves first. My name is Lucy. The man looked at the woman beside him. The woman rolled her eyes with a disdainful expression, but even with that expression, she stated her name. Karen. Next, the man called Lucy looked at the tall man. Luan Davis, a vampire slave. Lucy then looked at the man next to Luan, but the man refused to speak, so he said, Next up is Cornelius Funer, heir to the Funer clan, a clan of noble vampires. Right. What's your name? Lucy asked again. Karama. M.M. Now that we all know each other, I ask you, what was your sin? My sin? Yes. What did you do that angered a monster like Victor? Well. When Karama was about to explain what happened, he quickly stopped himself and said, Wait, why should I say this? Who are you, and why am I here? I'm sure I was hiding in Europe in a remote location. Karama tried to remember what had happened for him to end up here, but all he remembered was suddenly passing out and then waking up here. I've already told you my name and the reason you're here, 
Lucy replied monotonously. Screw this, I'm out. He didn't know what was going on, but he wasn't going to stay here with this group of strange people. Good luck, Lucy said. At that moment, Karama realized that everyone was looking at him with an amused expression as if they were waiting for his next actions. He inwardly sighed and walked toward the door. When he tried to open the door, he couldn't, and expecting this reaction, he wasn't surprised. So he exerted more force. But still, he couldn't open the door. Frustrated, Karama began to channel more power into his body and tried to pull the door, but nothing budged. He growled in irritation and punched the door, but all he got was immense pain in his hand. He shook his hand in an attempt to alleviate the pain and looked around the room angrily, spotting a window. Without wasting time, he tried to jump out of the window. But he only slammed his face into the glass and fell to the ground in pain. Suddenly, a collective laughter was heard all around. Karama grumbled in annoyance as he got up. For some reason, he felt weaker than before. What's going on? You're quite dumb, aren't you? Fox? I thought Kyuubai Kitsuns were much smarter than that. Karen mocked. Cough, cough. Lucy falsely coughed and then said, the correct term is Kyuubai Kitsun, Karen. Shut up, Lucy, Karen growled. Don't correct me. Yes, yes. Lucy rolled his eyes. As expected of a Karen, so temperamental. Just quit it with this old joke already. Aren't you bored? Karen grew even more irritated. Lucy glanced at Karen, and when he saw her annoyed face, he just smiled and said, Nat. While Karen and Lucy argued, Luin looked at Karama, who was becoming increasingly annoyed by Lucy and Karen's argument and spoke. If you still haven't figured out what happened, Fox, I'll tell you. You messed with Victor in the past, and now the demon has come to collect the debt. It's as simple as that. As for why you can't get out. Well, even we don't know that. We just know that this place is practically impenetrable. Karama's anger dissipated, leaving only resignation on his face. He sat on the floor and sighed. For someone who messed with the Demon King of Tyranny, now acclaimed as the Dragon God of Chaos, you all seem quite calm. Luan shrugged. He was a vampire slave and hadn't moved up in life since then. He couldn't help but find it ironic. He had entered the supernatural world before Victor but hadn't reached the same level of success in just a few years. I guess that's what we call talent and luck, Luan thought with a hint of depression. He no longer had the same mindset as before. After witnessing the demon's war and everyone around him dying, these things changed a person. Even Nightingale, a planet located in another galaxy, was not spared from the flames of war. Because of that war, he lost everything in the human world his cause, his family. And all that remained was to be forever enslaved to an immortal master. Did he hate Victor? Of course, he did, but he saw no hope in going against someone like him. He was simply too superior now. You're very good at pretending to be calm, Karama said sounding impressed. It was at that moment that Cornelius looked at Karama and said, Don't be deceived, Fox. We're not calm or pretending not to care, the circumstances are just different. While these two worms haven't done anything significant and even helped that bastard, we directly harmed him. So, we've just accepted our fate. I see, Karama nodded, indifferent to Cornelius's tone. Suddenly, Karen and Lucy stopped arguing while Karama, Cornelius and Lewin halted their conversation as they all looked in a certain direction. Something was there. A dark presence engulfing all the light in the room. He's here, Lucy murmured. Due to the room's silence and their supernatural senses, everyone heard Lucy's voice, causing an even more unknown feeling of fear. What were they dealing with? Karama didn't know. In fact, even Lucy and Karen, who had appeared here first, didn't know what kind of being they were dealing with. A figure emerged from the darkness. He was tall, wearing full armor. 
His face was pure darkness, covered by a hood that seemed to connect to his armor, but it wasn't that which caught the group's attention. It was the dark beam-like wings behind the man that appeared to be sucking all the light from the room. Karama was in shock as the sensation of encountering this unknown being filled him with fear. He instinctively knew he wasn't dealing with someone normal. The creature raised its hand, and then darkness began to form on the ground in front of the group. In the next moment, two more people appeared. Specifically, two men in priestly attire, two human exorcists. Age, huh? What's happening? Ugh. Can someone jot down the truck's license plate that hit me? That damn thing, I swear I'll kill it. He had a pretty foul mouth for a priest, but clearly, he wasn't a priest, he was an exorcist. Thomas and Jimmy, the creature spoke. Instantly, the two exorcists got up from the ground and looked at the creature. Just like Karama and everyone else present, fear was their instinctive response. His Imperial Majesty, my Almighty God, is pleased with your work over the years. Therefore, I am here to reward you. Hey! These were definitely not the words Thomas and Jimmy were expecting. Yes, they had betrayed their organization, but they did it because they had no choice. They hadn't done anything that would warrant this man's God's gratitude. Apparently, reading the minds of the two humans, the creature in front of them spoke, my God's understanding goes beyond any mortal or even immortal. Even among gods, he is special. The creature looked at the two men as if it could see their souls. He knows very well what your true feelings are. Both of them shuddered. At first. There was disgust and even hatred, you were being coerced. But every time you saw news of my god and the more powerful he became, your feelings started to change. You began to do the spying work with the same loyalty that the god king's subordinates have for him. And finally, when my god was acknowledged by all the gods at the supernatural beings gathering, you worked even more fervently. This loyalty was fully recognized, and I have come here to reward you. A miasma of pure darkness formed in the creature's hand, and he said, Do you accept? But what about our work? Jimmy, as the brains of the group, quickly asked. Spying is no longer necessary. With my king's senses, if he so desires, he can easily see the entire planet. Besides, espionage work is now being carried out by beings more suited for the task. May I ask something? Thomas raised his hand. The creature merely looked at Thomas, indicating for him to ask his question. Why are you rewarding us? Wouldn't it be easier to keep us as slaves only? Thomas. Jimmy elbowed his friend in the stomach, internally cursing his friend and his big mouth. Why couldn't he just stay quiet? A valid question. And the answer to that question is quite simple. My God is just. Work diligently, show results, be loyal, and demonstrate self-improvement, indicating that you are always progressing and you will be rewarded. No matter who you are, from slaves to even those at the top of the society he built, all receive the same treatment. Because he is just, the opposite treatment will be given to those who oppose him. For someone as simple as me, knowing that my hard work will be rewarded is enough, Thomas spoke. He would never openly admit it, but he was quite dissatisfied with his organization, which only asked him to sacrifice himself but didn't give anything more. Because of this, he focused more on his work as Ruby's spy because for every piece of information he provided to them, depending on its usefulness, he would gain significant rewards in the form of money. And for an orphan, this helped a lot. Thanks to these resources, he was able to help the orphanage he grew up in and even managed to create bounded fields created by witches that prevented the advance of lesser demons during the invasion. I accept, Thomas said. I accept as well, Jimmy said next. His reasons for accepting? Unlike his friend, Jimmy was a smart guy, and he knew that if he were on Victor's team, he would be a winner and become more influential. All these reasons they thought of were clearly seen by the being in front of them. He knew very well of Jimmy's ambition, and he didn't find it bad at all. After all, 
the demons were initially also loyal to Victor for a similar reason. Until they got a taste of power. Power was addictive, especially Victor's power. And that made them more and more fanatical and dedicated. However, Victor was not foolish enough to give power irresponsibly. Moreover, power given too easily could be taken away just as easily, and that moment would come when someone who had received power betrayed Victor. Jimmy and Thomas placed their hands in the creature's hand, and in the next moment, the darkness consumed their bodies. They couldn't even scream or express anything, they just fell to the ground and started writhing until they eventually stopped. Everyone just watched all of this in silence, their eyes entirely focused on the two humans on the ground. My name is War, the bearer of the will of the Chaos Dragon God. And here I proclaim. Chapter 934, A Just God. 2. My name is War, the bearer of the will of the Chaos Dragon God. And here I proclaim. Arise, heralds of chaos. The two creatures began to rise as a pair of wings of pure darkness formed behind them, their faces turned into pure darkness where nothing could be seen, and their garments changed into armor similar to wars, but with less bulk. Your god awaits you at the boundary where reality and imagination exert their greatest force. The two beings vanished and reappeared in a place where countless galaxies could be seen. Entirely automatically and perfectly synchronized, they both knelt in space toward a great cosmic horror on the horizon. The very sight of the creature was incomprehensible even to its heralds. Its mere presence altered reality, just as the creature's presence seemed to be devouring everything within its reach. It was also creating new galaxies, but they were not normal, appearing distorted, almost alive. It consumed everything, it altered everything, it created everything, and its very presence generated inconsistencies in creation. This magnificent creature was the god they had sworn to serve. And the sight of this being invoked feelings in the two men. Despite their current appearance, they still retained the consciousness of their human side, although that side had been greatly altered, they just didn't realize it. No one had a chance from the beginning. Jimmy thought upon seeing this being. How can anyone fight against this? Even with their current transformation, he never considered the word fight. Even if this being were an enemy, only the word flee would be in his mind. Although your actions are more motivated by desire, that is not a sin because only desire can drive a being, War looked at Lucy and Karen. Therefore, the offer also extends to you. War looked at Lucy and Karen. What is your response? Do you accept power in exchange for servitude? War raised his hand in the same way as before. We accept. Lucy and Karen wasted no time. Their reason? The same as always. They wanted to be more than they were now, desiring strength. So, they simply jumped and grasped War's hand, and soon the same scene repeated itself, and the two disappeared. War looked at Lewin and Cornelius. As for you. Why are you coming after us? After our initial conflict, we never saw trouble with Victor again, Cornelius asked, knowing he would die anyway. He just wanted to know why he would die after all this time. My God never forgets an offense. We've been keeping an eye on you from the beginning, but we saw no need to act until now when he decided to wipe all his enemies from existence, War replied. He might have forgiven you if you had a use for him or if any of his wives tried to speak for you. But such a reality never came to be. I see, that's fair. I would have done the same if I were in his position, Cornelius accepted this surprisingly well. War changed people, and the demon invasion made him understand. Being weak is a sin. If a being is strong, it doesn't matter if they are a hypocrite, a tyrant, a liar, an asshole, or petty, everything they do would be justified. Why? Because they are strong. Cornelius thought he was strong, but Victor's growing achievements were a reality check for him. He wasn't strong. He was just a frog that never left his own well. War raised his hand, in an act of mercy, I will ensure the complete erasure of your soul. Is that being merciful? Cornelius spoke with morbid amusement. If his soul was erased, 
he wouldn't be able to reincarnate when he died. Even if he wouldn't remember his previous existence, he didn't want complete erasure. The sin of desiring my god's wife typically results in eternal torture in one of the hells personally commanded by a woman who is a professional demon torturer. She can perform torture arts worthy of Lovecraftian books. So, what will you choose? Eternal torture? Or soul erasure? Just erase my existence, Cornelius spoke in a tired tone. War looked at Karama, and all the hairs on Karama's tail stood on end. Before he could even think of doing something or taking action, he found himself floating in the air with the creature holding him by the neck. Eternal torture, death, all of that is too good for you. You are one of those responsible for hurting my god's daughter. So, only pure terror awaits you. Karama vanished into the darkness. The four heralds of chaos, who had remained with their heads bowed, lifted their faces when a man with nine tails appeared in this space. Before he could understand anything, two women appeared in front of the four and summoned a shield of pure white and red energy. In the next moment, an unknown sound from the depths of space echoed, and the creature released its energy toward Karama. With just this gesture, hundreds more stars were distorted by its presence. If the two women had not appeared, the four heralds would have been harmed. Karama himself began to scream as tears of blood streamed down his face and he began to pull at his hair in agony. It was a horrifying sight to behold, but it didn't stop there as his body began to distort, and he became a floating ball of flesh, then he exploded, only to reappear in his normal appearance. His body was dragged to the center of their god, where he would suffer the most terrible of horrors forever. Once the situation calmed down again, the two women with hair made of pure power disappeared and returned to observing everything from afar. Sister, I still think it's not a good idea to bring these people here to see Darling's appearance, Amara said. I agree, but it was Darling's wish. As his heralds, they must understand who their god is. His words, not mine, Roxanne replied. I know, but... This is our exclusive space, right? I don't want to share it with them, Amara pouted. Is that the issue? Roxanne looked incredulously at Amara. Apparently, she completely misunderstood her sister's complaints. Well, I agree with you, this was my exclusive space until you showed up. But I've learned to tolerate your presence. Amara pursed her lips at her sister's acerbic words. Changing the subject, how can those beings appear here? They are not connected to him like we are, right? Amara asked. That's not necessarily true. After all, they were created with the essence of chaos that created war. They are indeed connected to Darling, but not as deeply as we are, Roxanne explained. Not to mention that when our father visited Victor, he did something to his inner world, something that made Victor's soul even more special. Well, that's true. It's not every day that a being has three inner dimensions within their own soul. The dimensions Amara was talking about were, of course, Hell, Victor's planet, and the newly conquered Egyptian pantheon that was slowly integrating into his soul. Yes, we will fulfill your wish, the four said at the same time, and then they disappeared. Amara was puzzled. What did Darling say? Were you not paying attention? Roxanne asked. I wasn't, Amara was honest. Roxanne looked at Amara for a few seconds, then just sighed, he ordered them to go after more enemies. There are more. Amara spoke incredulously. Darling is very beloved. Dot. Roxanne emphasized the word beloved with irony. Yes. He is, Amara nodded. War looked at Luan. Choose. Slavery or death with the possibility of reincarnation. Is what you said about your god being just, true? You wouldn't be talking to me here if it weren't. Despite the conflict in the past, you were just a weak lackey, and your involvement in everything was basically an act of bullying, and to my god, that didn't necessarily upset him. After all, it was his fault for being weak back then. Lewin was surprised by War's words, but he soon understood where these words were coming from. 
right. The mentality of supernatural beings is to dominate the weak. I choose slavery. Lewin spoke. He didn't care internally, he was just exchanging his current leash for another, but at least this time, he had a slight chance of progressing and becoming stronger. Very well. A choker appeared on Lewin's neck, and in the next moment, he disappeared, reappearing in a place resembling a desert. Yet, at the same time, it had a futuristic city and a paradisiacal nature. He looked around and saw several incredibly beautiful beings wearing the same choker as he was. Are these gods? Lewin was shocked when he felt his body instinctively reject these beings, and now that he realized it, he was under the sun, but he wasn't burning. He didn't understand what was happening, but he could tell that war had thrown him somewhere. A woman with demonic horns and a tail resembling a reptile's tail looked at Luan, then glanced at a holographic device on her wrist. Number 069L. Yes. Luan's mouth spoke automatically. Get in line, your work will be assigned shortly. Yes. Luan walked in a rather robotic manner. What's happening? I can't move as I want to. Don't resist. It'll be worse for you, he heard someone say next to him. Turning his eyes in the direction of that being, he saw a tall white man with red tattoos on his body and long black hair. W who are you dot? A lesser god who was foolish enough to support a god who only thought with his lower head. He laughed at his own joke and walked toward the line. Number 069L, into the line, now the demon-like woman ordered more forcefully. Lewin's entire body shook with excruciating pain that caused his brain to fail for several seconds. What's worse, he couldn't even scream. Soon, his body began to move, and he stopped in line next to the god. I told you. Ugh. Just. He couldn't get the question he was trying to ask out. And the god didn't care either. Just a tip. If the wardens order you to do something, you do it. They are fair beings, they won't treat you like we gods treated our slaves like toys in the past, or even how demons treated their slaves, a very fair demon, I must say. But I think that attitude is due to the respect they have for their emperor. Mm. That's likely it, after all, as long as they do their job properly, they will be rewarded. If not for that, a bunch of demons as God's wardens would go very wrong. These demons would definitely take advantage of the situation. The God seemed to be in contemplation for a few seconds until he looked back at Luan. In any case, if you refuse to do what you're ordered, you'll just end up on the warden's blacklist, and believe me, they're very eager for someone to land on their blacklist. He laughed morbidly, completely terrifying Luan. Be a good slave number 069L, and who knows. Maybe in the future, you'll get out of this situation. After all, our Imperial Majesty may be all that's wrong in the world, but he's definitely fair. See. The god pointed to a spot. Lewin looked at that place and saw a goddess with chocolate-colored skin and a dark-skinned god. The demon-like woman with white horns and blue skin that emitted a cold air stopped in front of the two gods. Clearly. She was one of the ice demons from hell. You have achieved great accomplishments. The act of voluntarily helping our society grow to what it is today without complaining and indicating new places that could be of great help to His Imperial Majesty, which was previously unknown to us until then, has earned you great rewards. Congratulations, number 089U and number 081K, you are now free. Now you can use your identities as you once did. God Upuot, with concepts encompassing war, and Goddess Kook, with concepts encompassing the unknown and darkness, you are now exemplary citizens. I hope you live according to the rules imposed by His Imperial Majesty. Congratulations! The Ice Demon clapped, and then all the demons around also clapped. Following this example, the slaves nearby also clapped. The two mentioned gods just smiled slightly but from their expressions, it was clear that they were relieved. Lewin sighed, a bit relieved at this sight. That man was telling the truth. 
but a place where even the gods are slaves, hey? Just what place is this? Chapter 935, Anna's Possessiveness Victor opened his eyes and muttered, All my enemies in this sector are gone. The small fries are missing now, and the rest are those who fled to another sector. Victor didn't do things by halves. From the moment he established his complete dominance, he worked on secretly eliminating all those who attacked him and targeted his family in the past. By following his code of conduct, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and blood for blood. He did not forget those who harmed him, just some specific cases in which this code of conduct did not apply, which was the case of Luan, Aphrodite, Persephone, Mizuki, and other beings who were initially his enemy but became his ally and some even wife. As someone who had so many mentalities of powerful beings within him, he knew that this code of conduct was not exactly correct. After all, supernatural beings were as complex as humans, but Victor didn't care. This code has always been with him since it's part of who he is, and therefore, he won't change. In the same way that the warrior's code came to be taught to him by Scat Hatch, a code that, if you think about it, is also flawed. But despite his flaws, Victor didn't care. The reason? He needed to have a moral. No matter what it was, he needed to have it. With his current power, with his current nature, he can be diagnosed as a chaotic being. If he did not have morals or the willpower to exercise his own will, he would be dominated by his instincts. Therefore, despite being flawed, Victor didn't care because that's what his essence was he was a flawed being, and that's okay, after all, he's not trying to be perfect. Hum dot. Hearing a seductive moan, Victor looked at his chest and saw a goddess with long black hair who was resting peacefully. A small, gentle smile appeared on his face when he saw the goddess's relaxed state. The Persephone of today was different from the old one, it could be said that the Persephone of now was the perfect representation of a warrior queen. Therefore, she would not rest so unprotected near someone if she did not trust that person. Victor got up a little, leaned his back against the wall, and started caressing the dragon goddess's long black hair. His caresses proved effective when the black-haired goddess was about to wake up and went back to sleep again. As blood dragons who have within themselves all the characteristics of a noble vampire and a dragon, it would be almost impossible to tire any of his wives and even himself but when he did these intimate acts like a god, it's not just the physical body that is in the relationship, the soul is also. After all, the act of sleeping with someone is, in some ways, one of the most intimate acts there is. Because of this, Persephone's tired state was evident when they fought her soul mixed with Victor's immense and powerful soul, not to mention his constant attacks on her physical body, she couldn't help but be tired and satisfied. How many days have passed? Four days Victor. Amara responded before Roxanne could. Inside Victor's soul, Roxanne looked at Amara with a not very friendly look. A look that Amara completely ignored. I see. Victor nodded. The perspective of time becomes confusing when you have three-dimensional worlds within you and can project your consciousness toward your most chaotic self. Talking about my most chaotic self. Victor's dragon features, except for his eyes, began to disappear, and the next moment, fox ears and ten tails appeared on his back. Umu, as expected, that Elder God's predation was one of the best powers I could acquire. This specific power completely fused with something Victor already had within him and became even stronger. Because of this, the moment Victor made Karama his cosmic snack, he was able to use his form, powers, abilities, and memory fully. He acquired complete control of the fox's entire existence. Oh! Victor watched in amusement as his physical body changed, except for his heart, eyes, and soul, his entire physical body was a perfect imitation of what a Kyuubai Kitsune would be. Well, vampires are shapeshifters, and I raised that power to the ninth power when I turned into a dragon, so such a power wouldn't be unrealistic. Victor lightly scratched his skin, and just as he expected, even though his body was mimicking the body of a yukai. Some characteristics, like its impenetrable defense and ridiculous strength, 
still remained. Ideas began to appear in Victor's head, and in the next moment, his body began to change again. Hmm. The dragon characteristics returned, but internally, he had the physiology of the demon Diablo, the fallen angel Gabriel, and the angel Michael. He also put on some physiological ones like that of the primordial god Erebus and Nocturnos. Yes. This goes far beyond what a simple shapeshifter can do. It seems that Predator's power has been altered more than the original. The ability to reproduce only the good parts of several different races within oneself was something far beyond what a shapeshifter could do. He was basically a chimera at that moment. Although his soul itself did not change, it remained a dragon's soul. His essence also remained that of a dragon, the proof of this was that his heart and eyes did not change even after several attempts. After playing a little with these newly discovered characteristics about his powers, Victor came to the conclusion that he was correct. Yes, when I absorbed that Elder God and the powers of adaptation and predation joined with me, it caused some changes in my powers, and because of that, I can completely exert the form of what I absorb, except for the features like eyes, and the dragon's heart. Victor suspects that his divinities, specifically his begin divinity, were influencing this as well. I really need to train again. He sighed internally. He had so many powers now that it would be a waste not to explore every single one of them. He would be a fool to remain without making an effort like the gods with so much potential to explore. The powers he absorbed from the Elder God and his ascension as a god significantly changed many powers within him. Victor stopped using his powers, and in the next instant, his entire body changed to dragon characteristics automatically. Feeling some contractions around his lower limb, Victor looked down and saw the black-haired goddess looking at him with a lazy and somewhat amused look. What are you doing? Doing some tests with my metamorphosis. Hum dot. Persephone nodded as she wrapped her arm around Victor's neck and snuggled into him. What did you discover? That I have more untapped potential than I thought. That's quite scary, Persephone commented. The man beside her was definitely an irregularity. Even after reaching such a high level of existence, he still had the potential to grow. His existence was as if the word limit did not apply. Victor stroked Persephone's black hair and lightly pulled the hard peak of one of her mounds as he complained, Are you saying your husband is scary? Hmm. Yes, he is. I pity the other beings who get on his bad side. She purred as she bucked her insides to squeeze the member inside her that had remained there since they began fighting through the night. She doesn't know why, but she loved the feeling of having her insides completely filled, this feeling of spasms of pleasure throughout her body, and it left her instinct very satisfied. Speaking of instinct, perhaps this desire comes from my instinct. After all, I heard that dragons have a very difficult time having children. Persephone thought as she closed her eyes again and relaxed as she enjoyed Victor's caresses. The rule was clear, the stronger you were, the harder it was for you to have children. Of course, unless you are a progenitor. The only reason Victor hadn't had children until now was because he didn't want to. After all, they were living in a dangerous place, and he was also learning about the supernatural world. Not to mention that he also didn't have time to think about it because every time he overcame a problem, another annoying problem would appear. Usually caused by him or by other beings who were interested in him and wanted to manipulate him. The door opened, and Anna entered the room. For a moment, she froze when she saw where Persephone and Victor were connected, she took a deep breath, but this proved to be a foolish idea as all the odors from the room entered her nostrils, making her body shudder slightly. Her red, draconic eyes narrowed even further when she saw a white liquid leaking from Victor and Persephone's connection. She took a deep breath once more and did her best to control her inner desires, something that proved to be very difficult considering that her current nature was the perfect representation of honesty. This same power also affected her, making it impossible for her to deceive herself. Therefore, despite coming here with the purpose of calling Victor about a minor problem related to some pantheons. She ignored it entirely and walked towards the bed, which, despite being messy, 
was not destroyed or dirty either, indicating that Victor had somehow cleaned everything up with his powers. Victor raised his eyebrow in curiosity when he saw Anna walking towards the bed. When she got close to the bed, her long black and red dress disappeared, leaving her only in the black garter belt that she liked to wear. The next moment, she just pushed back the thick blanket, climbed into bed, covered herself with the blanket again, and with a wave of her hand, she closed the door she entered through. Then she snuggled into Victor's right side as she hugged him. She took another deep breath and then smiled, satisfied. I love this smell. Persephone turned her head to the side and opened her eyes. When she saw Anna lying down, she opened her eyes wide in shock, and that shock turned to horror when Anna opened her eyes and looked at Persephone. Seeing those lifeless, obsessive eyes made her shudder internally with fear, and despite being a dragon goddess and a very powerful ruler, she couldn't shake that fear. The intensity in Anna's eyes only diminished when Persephone unconsciously moved a little away from Victor, making their connection dissolve with an obscene pop. White liquids began to come out of Persephone's insides, but she didn't care about it and just watched as Anna took over the spot where she was previously while she cautiously touched his member to her wet entrance. Feeling the sensation of heat provided by Victor's rigid member near her entrance, Anna smiled, satisfied, as she moved her panties a little, let his member touch her naked entrance, and then hugged Victor gently while snuggling. She took a deep breath again and then hugged him even tighter. Her insides were extremely hot hot as magma itself, and this was reflected in the liquids leaking from inside her. He is mine. She thought, as a threatening red aura emitted from her body, although this aura was only threatening to Persephone. To Victor, this was just an open declaration of her inner desires being driven by her own power. Hmm. Victor made a noise as if he was thinking. Although he was satisfied with Anna's possessiveness, the way she was acting was unacceptable. Finishing his thoughts, he pulled Anna and Persephone closer to him and started caressing the two women with black hair, bringing his face closer to Anna's ear and speaking. Behave yourself. Anna's body shuddered, and she growled in defiance, but when she saw Victor's gaze intensifying, she flinched and snuggled in even more submissively, and in the next moment, the threatening aura coming out of her body completely changed into a friendly aura. Persephone sighed in relief and when she was going to think about what happened, she started to feel Victor's caresses, and her thoughts became utterly blank. She didn't care about anything now and just enjoyed that feeling. Draconic instincts, hey! Victor thought as he looked at Anna and Persephone. For some reason, he had a premonition that he would experience a lot of heartache over this in the future, specifically from his own daughters.